Brevard County is a community on the move as one of the fastest growing counties in the state. With increased business opportunities, a booming tourism industry, and a key role in the return to space, living in Brevard County means being where the action is. And in the middle of that action is Brevard Public Schools. Brevard Public Schools is a community leader actively working to shape young lives into individuals capable of making real world impact. Accessibility is of high importance, and as such, 84 schools are offered throughout the county, spanning from Mims to Palm Bay. Proud to be an A district with a 90% graduation rate, Brevard ensures students have every opportunity to succeed. This can be seen in the 414 graduates who earned their associate's degree while still in high school and the 47% of graduates who earned certificates in STEM and CTE courses. Further showcasing national leadership in career and technical education, Brevard students dominate in science, with seven high schools ranked as America's best for STEM. For those students interested in other areas of study, our schools offer 82 different industry certifications, a unique aviation assembly and fabrication program, a top-notch robotics program, and a maritime program that uses technology only found in one Florida high school right here in Brevard. All of our CTE programs prepare students for college and the workforce, whether in automotive tech, 911 public safety, or culinary. These programs strengthen the future of our children and Brevard County. Not just available to high school students, CTE programs are in middle school and yes, elementary schools too. When it comes to academics, our students shine using a robust AP program, dual enrollment, Cambridge program, international baccalaureate program, and National Honor Society. If you want the best educators in Florida, they are inside Brevard classrooms. Experienced, energized teachers and staff are leading our kids from kindergarten to graduation. At Brevard Public Schools, the sky is not the limit. We aim for beyond. Apollo Elementary was built in 1966, right in the middle of the Apollo program, which brought the astronauts to the moon. This school has a special place in Titusville because of that, and I think it's important for us to continue our relationship with Kennedy Space Center and the space program. The best thing about the school, it's an environment where students are nurtured, where they are given what they need to become global citizens, where everybody works together collaboratively so that they can be successful. My favorite thing about Apollo is just the culture that it promotes. The teachers are kind and they work together and the students respond well to them. When you have everybody working together, it just makes a stronger school. Just being such a tight-knit community, we really want to work with those kids that maybe are struggling in an area. We work a lot with the kids that maybe are excelling in academically. We have a lot of programs. We will make sure that every child is taken care of no matter what the need is. They know no matter what when they go home that they're loved and we just want to see Apollo continue to succeed. It is really easy at Apollo to make friends and I got lots of great friends here. I really love how the teachers helped me here at Apollo Elementary. I actually want to be an astrophysicist when I grow up because of all the space type things we do here at Apollo. We actually have a moon tree. There are seeds that they took to space and took them back and one of them is actually planted right in front of the school. It's really great to walk through the school knowing that this school has a part of history that will forever live on in our lives. My favorite thing about Astronaut High School are the students. The students make everything that we do worthwhile. I think the most unique aspect about our school is that we serve a diverse population. 
We have outstanding experienced educators who really put the students first and celebrate our ability to serve our students here at Astronaut High. My favorite thing about Astronaut High School is the community. The culture is about every student being successful. From the moment you step in here, it's a different feeling. There is no other school like Astronaut High School. We are just here to support our students, support our community, because we are a family. There is something for everyone here at Astronaut. From accelerated academic programs like our AP Academy, to our career and technical programs, such as welding, construction, and nursing, we have great opportunities for all of our students. We have a group of teachers who feel like Astronaut High School is home. They're truly invested in the students and they want to see them succeed. The connection between our administration, it's what makes the school work and it's what makes this such a special place. I feel like everyone's really involved here. It's a really positive environment. Everyone here is like a family. Everyone's here to support you and make sure that you succeed in everything that you do. My favorite thing about Astronaut High is just the experience and the friendships I have here at the school and, and the relationships I build here. There's many things that you can do here at Astronaut High School and they give you so many opportunities. The teachers really do care about your future. Astronaut just gives me that, that home feeling. If I could describe Astronaut High School in one word, it would be passion. Family. Community. Excellence. Learning. Special. It would definitely be pride. Upon arriving to this campus, they're going to arrive to an atmosphere of caring faculty. Teachers are energetic about what they do. Their passion is undeniable. Their reputation is undeniable throughout the county, and not just throughout the county, but throughout the state of Florida. Whether the student has ambition to go to Harvard or Yale or to be a machinist at the Cape or one of our local industries, those opportunities exist and they're well-rounded for any student, whether it's in the classroom, the athletic department, our clubs and activities, our JROTC program, which is a very popular program here at Bayside High School. Even our BLAST program, which is students that have graduated but have decided to continue on in their education, they have real-world experience in transitioning from school to independent living. I can't say enough wonderful things about the CTE department and all of the variety of courses we offer from machining to culinary, TV productions, drafting. Not only do we have world-class instructors, but we have world-class equipment. There are a lot of academic opportunities here for kids at Bayside High School. The dual enrollment program and the early admissions program is where students can enroll in Eastern Florida classes. And if they complete the program, they can graduate with their AA degree and their high school diploma. We have a wide variety of AP courses here that they can take on campus and earn college credit for. There's something for everyone. The staff definitely does care about us here. I feel like they tailor us in a certain way so that we all feel comfortable learning certain things because not everyone's the same. They really try to make it beneficial and comfortable for everyone. At Bayside High School, I always feel like staff and faculty are putting an extra step forward when it comes to their student success. They're very easy to reach out to and will always help you with anything academic related and non-academic related. The people you'll meet here are just wonderful and they're super easy to get along with. Community is just Fantastic. In Heritage High School, you can find a lot of different cultures, diversity, and everybody respect each other. And it's kind of like a really, really big family. <laughs> We have very successful students that are striving for excellence in many different ways. We have Cambridge programs, we have dual enrollment, we have uh, CTE programs, automotive programs, the Academy of Environmental Water and Technology, have a very strong athletic program, and then of course we have the best band in the business and our performing arts programs are very good also. So all types of opportunities here at Heritage High School for a well-rounded student that enjoys the performing arts, that enjoys athletics, but also has college and career in the back of their mind. My favorite thing honestly has to be our Cambridge program. The kids have a chance of earning college credit while they're right here on campus with us. If the students earn their Cambridge diploma and also get 100 hours of community service, they qualify for Bright Futures, which will pay for their college for up to a four-year degree plus a book stipend. 
Our kids, they get along, our teachers, they love them. And we hear this back and forth from the kids. We have visitors that come onto campus and they make comment about how pleasant our kids are to interact with. We are inclusive, we are robust, and your kids will feel welcomed here. I feel like the staff here really does care about the students' success and just their well-being. We have great teachers here to get you prepared for the exams. Here at Heritage, you can do everything at once. I can manage TV productions, live stream all the football games, and earn my Cambridge diploma at the same time. I love being a student here because it's so easy to meet new people. People aren't segregated into their groups of band kids or athletes or this or that. Everybody mixes together so you can really make a lot of different friends at once. Imperial's a fun place to be. The school is family, and that's what my classroom is. You as a parent become part of the family. You work close with the teachers. The teachers know each student. I have third graders that come to my door to wave at me and tell me good morning. So it's just a family atmosphere. Your child's coming to a school that they're going to feel the love. They're going to feel that we care about them and their growth. We have a lot of teachers and staff members that put in the extra effort and time to get to know our kids and work with our kids. You come here because we do have quality educators and we thrive ourselves on getting better and doing our best with our students in the classroom and outside of it. We have some great programs, the robotics program. We have wonderful computerized programs where we're dealing with technologies. And we have a great art program where students can stay after school and you know work on their creativity. The students are able to help each other out. They've got a lot of spark. Everyone's helpful and friendly. And like, if you don't know something, if you just ask someone, they'll lead you the right way. You can be yourself and no one will make fun of you. This is a special school that is always wondrous to come to in the morning. They're really special because these teachers, they've taught you for years and they know you, they know your family, they know all of you basically. We have the greatest kids, we have the greatest teachers, and we have an outstanding community. We believe in every child's ability to learn, and we believe it's our responsibility as educators to create access for them, to access the educational world and have the success that they deserve. We are an AVID school. We're one of the few AVID elementaries, one of only two here in Brevard schools. And AVID, I believe, really helps create the purpose for why students come to school. It helps them understand what elementary school is going to do for them in the future. We have a lot of great programs like our drone teams, our sea perch teams. We have STEM clubs and STEAM clubs. We have orchestra. They've been growing vegetables in the garden. They're learning and exploring. And I have no doubt that we're cultivating the next generation of thinkers, innovators, and creators. And I'm very excited for what our kids are doing. At Palm Bay Elementary, we have quite a few programs that are unique. We're a Special Olympics Unified Champion School, so we're super proud of our large exceptional education program. Part of that is our gifted student program. Our kids are super involved in lots of different academic competitions and different community events. So we have a lot of opportunities for kids outside the classroom to participate in authentic learning. Palm Bay Elementary is a special place to work and learn and grow because of our sense of community and our commitment to our students. We give them the platform to practice their leadership skills. At Palm Bay Elementary, the teachers make you feel really welcoming and comfortable here. It feels like family. The first day you came here, it feels like you're automatically just a part of it. What's awesome about Palm Bay Elementary is where they always have something new every year or a month. And they offer new clubs or more hands-on activities. And I also like that you can make a lot of new friends in this school and have opportunities to learn new things in this school. We have really grown and really been able to 
offer some very unique learning opportunities for students. I fully believe that the school is one of the best kept secrets in South Brevard. We have anything and everything you can imagine and you're not gonna find much like this in the district. We're the only magnet high school in Brevard County where our focus is STEAM. We have so many opportunities within that. Not only the rigorous courses such as dual enrollment and AP and honors, we have a Pirate to Panther program where you can take college courses at FIT while you're in high school. It's complimentary to our students. AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. We provide leadership and community service opportunities. We have an AVID tutoring center. Students volunteer during their lunch to help all students on campus so everybody gets support. We all have one goal in mind and that's for our students to succeed. Palm Bay Magnet High School is an emotionally safe environment. It's diversity is its strength and when I say diversity I don't just mean cultural or linguistic diversity. We have a wide range of academic abilities, we have a wide range of programs to meet every student at every level that they come to us and we have such knowledgeable faculty but they're not just knowledgeable they're really genuinely caring and they want to meet the students where they are and work to make them come up to where we need them to be and to where they need themselves to be. It's been amazing. I've seen aspects both from in the classroom and in sports. We all support one another. The coaches are great. They're going to push you to be your best on and off the court. Our teammates are going to push each other. We know our strengths and weaknesses and we continue to strive for the better for all of us and not just individually. One of the things you notice if you talk to any of the adults on campus is how much they genuinely care for the students here. The goal of Palm Bay High is for everyone to feel included. The culture of Port Malabar can be summed up as positive, supportive. Many of our teachers have their own kids enrolled here. Many of the teachers were students themselves here. So I'm very proud of that family-oriented, family-focused, very warm, welcoming feeling that we have here at Port Malabar. Academics and social emotional growth will be the focal point, and we will take pride in making sure your child grows and progresses. Port Malabar Elementary is an incredibly unique place for your child to attend. We have several unique programs. We have an exceptional gifted program. We focus on multiple intelligences such as art, music, STEM, and the kids really shine. The teachers take such good care of the kids here. Honestly, safety is first and after that, we just love your children so much. When you walk in, you can feel it. There's love here, there's caring. We take good care of the kids and they wanna come back every day. We also have five teachers that are bilinguals. So we're very proud of that. We try to have one per grade level. So if your student is struggling with English, we can accommodate them. Usted tiene eh, un alumno que no habla todavía inglés. Nosotros podemos ayudarlo y acomodarlo porque podemos ponerlo en un salón donde la maestra habla español. I like coming to school because the teachers care about me and my and like my own way. My favorite thing at Port Malabar is recess because it's the time where you make new friends and you get to spend time with them. I feel like our teachers really do care about us and they comfort us when we may be having a bad day or something's going on either at school or at home. It does feel really special when we're recognized for our hard work because of our Pelican Pride Awards. Prepared, respectful, improved, dependable, and enthusiastic. I've had a really fun time here at Port Malabar and I totally recommend it. Riviera is a very open school. We'll do almost anything for our students in order to make sure that they're successful. We do believe in that village mentality where it takes a full village to raise a child. The thing that excites me the most is we're not stagnant. Every year, our expectations here for our students expand and they get greater and greater. What gets me excited about coming to work each day are the kids, seeing them learn. I enjoy greeting them in the morning, seeing their excitement for coming to school every day and the positivity that they have, knowing that no matter what happens, we're here to support them and they're safe while they're here doing it. I'm really proud of the work that we've done at Riviera to make our core academics really strong, specifically in the areas of reading and math and science. 
I am very proud of the fact that we're all a tight knit community and we're all working towards a common goal, which is for the students to be successful. We're full of instructors and staff that reflect. And so our number one goal is to make every day better than the day before. For me and my team, we love seeing the progression that the students have. The light bulb going off is basically why we do what we do. We work hard with these students five days a week. So you're sitting with that student and those students working hard and to see them progress, see them understand something, it makes it all worth it. For someone new coming to Riviera, you can expect kind people and people that can help you. They don't just like say the answer, they teach me how to get the answer. I like science because we get to do some experiments time to time. They provide kindness, respectfulness, and mostly fun. I am a product of Brevard Public Schools. I've been with Brevard Public Schools for approximately 18 years. South Lake is an amazing school and what makes it special is the collaboration between the teachers and the faculty. Well, students have different learning styles, and part of what we do in the Smart Lab is that choice. If they're interested in 3D printing, or video, or building, engineering, and I think that giving students the opportunity to follow their passions in the Smart Lab helps with engagement, helps them find that success. As students decide on the careers that they want to do, what they learn here is really going to help. I love the fact that we honor, respect, and take ownership in all the diversity and the differences and uniquenesses of all of our teachers, staff, and the students. Every aspect of South Lake is a teaching opportunity. Be ready to be enriched, get ready for the adventure of learning, and not just having one teacher, but having 50 teachers. Not just having one friend, but having hundreds of friends. In my opinion, I really liked PE and the Smart Lab. You do things on the computer and things with robots. And I really like it. You can go into school and go like, oh, I wonder what is going to happen today because there's just new things every day to try. For me, you can kind of like feel the friendliness about South Lake. You can wave at people and they'll wave back. Like you smile and they smile. I love South Lake because of stuff like that. When I talk to fellow people and I say I'm at Sunrise, they say, oh, I've heard of that school. Oh, I know that school. It's always for really amazing things. We are making the kids more responsible for their learning now. We are all here for the children and just holding them up to, I think, higher expectations. Knowing that we will reach every child here on whatever level they need is why they should come to Sunrise. Sunrise Elementary is a school community where it, it just radiates joy and love and a super passion for learning. Sunrise is well known for academic success and helping every student shine. Our teachers love what they do. They learn right along with the students, but they also collaborate with one another to plan and execute amazing, fun, and engaging lessons. And that's what I want for the future of Sunrise Elementary School. I want our little sea turtles that come here to be able to come, start when they're young, grow up in our school, and we want to be able to help them meet their full potential and help them shine as they become young adults in the world. We came up with three standards that aligned with our core values, which is be safe, work hard, and be nice. And we run our day-to-day -day lives here at Sunrise that way. And we recognize students and staff and faculty that follow that mindset. You know, it's just a great guideline of what you should be doing at all times. Every teacher's classroom rules aligns with the Sunrise standards. You can ask any student and they'll tell you what the Sunrise standards are. We really work on having those kids take ownership of their behavior. All the teachers care about all the students and all the students like look up to the teachers. Everybody's very kind, everybody's very nice and like it's just a great place to be. 
All the teachers, they're wonderful. They don't treat the students differently. They treat all the students the same. They never treat you because of how smart you are. They treat you because of who you are.
Good evening. I'm happy to welcome my fellow board members and the public and call the October 26, 2021 school board meeting to order. This is a business meeting of the board held in the public. As such, the board is authorized to adopt rules or policies to maintain orderly conduct and proper decorum in a public meeting. Please note that your presence here is subject to those rules and policies. Pursuant to Florida Statute 877.13, it is unlawful and a misdemeanor of the second degree, punishable by up to 60 days in jail and a $500 fine for any person knowingly to disrupt or interfere with the lawful administration or functions of any educational institution or school board, or knowingly to advise, counsel, or instruct any school pupil or school employee to disrupt any school or school board function or activity on school board property. To facilitate board business, please be aware of the following. The current emergency face mask mandate states that if Brevard County reaches a level of 50 COVID cases per 100,000 people, the superintendent could transition the mask mandate from having a medical exemption to having a parental opt-out for students, which happened on Friday. However, adults are still required to wear a face mask covering the nose and mouth while on school board property unless social distancing of six feet can be maintained or you have provided a medical exemption. The appropriate place for public participation in the meeting is during your individual public comment opportunity as identified in the agenda. Outside of your individual public comment opportunity, your role in the meeting is as an observer. Once again, this is a meeting for board business held in the public. Our agenda is quite lengthy and I will take appropriate measures to ensure we are able to continue with board business without interruption. I will ask persons deemed to be knowingly or intentionally disrupting this meeting of the School Board of Brevard County or not complying with policy to stop or leave. If persons receiving the warning choose not to follow my instructions, I will instruct Brevard County Sheriff's deputies to take any law enforcement action they deem appropriate, and you may be escorted, detained, or arrested, depending on the conduct. Persons who refuse to depart after a warning may also be committing the crime of trespassing in accordance with Florida Statute Section 810.08. These statutes apply to conduct on all school board property, which includes this boardroom, as well as the outside of this building to the sidewalks. If you continue to cause a disruption, you are advised that you are in violation of Florida State Statute 877.13, or if you fail to leave the premises after being warned by the Sheriff's Office, you are committing trespass, and the board has authorized the Sheriff's Office to enforce these rules. In the event multiple individuals fail to adhere to these expectations and board business cannot continue due to disruption, I will call a recess and request that the law enforcement officers present clear the boardroom of attendees. When the room is cleared, the board will return and resume their meeting with no public present. Those who are signed up to speak will be seated under the front entry area and called in when it is your time to speak. Pam, roll call please. Mrs. Belford? Present. Ms. McDougall? Present. Mrs. Jenkins? Present. Mr. Susan? Present. And Mrs. Campbell? The board will now hold a moment of silent reflection in memory of three BPS family members who recently passed away. Michael Storm, a mechanic in our transportation department, James Sestillo, also a mechanic in our transportation department, and Shri Ali, a kindergarten teacher at Gulfview Elementary. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to offer my fellow board members and Dr. Mullins the opportunity to recognize students, staff, or members of our community who'd like to start us off this evening. Ms. McDougall? Sure. I just want to give a shout out to a food service manager at um, Freedom 7, who also happens to be the food service manager at Roosevelt. So he is doing two schools. So a shout out to uh, Devin Smith which I did give him an impact elevated pen because he is definitely um, elevating <laughs> two kitchens. And I found out um, the other day when I was there, I looked around the kitchen, I said, okay, there's you and one other person. Are you the only two? And they were the only two because someone um, 
was out on injury. Wow. And so there's two people serving <laughs> in the serving line and cooking for over 400 people, uh, 400 students. Wow. But I do want to also give a shout out to the volunteers who help at Freedom 7 to make that smooth run smoothly. So shout out to um, Devin Smith and the volunteers at Freedom 7. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. Anyone else? Ms. Campbell? I have uh, a few, but I'll be fast. Uh, last Tuesday night, we, the Children's Hunger Project, um, who I also get to serve on their board, held a packing party for all our school coordinators who coordinate you know, which students are in need, and Children's Hunger Project doesn't get those names, they just get numbers. Um, but we just had a little celebration, but also we packed 850 meals that go out to our schools. And thank you, Dr. Mullins, for coming and joining us. One table team may have packed a little more than the other tables team, but um, we had a good night and we're so thankful for all those people. The rest of them are going tonight to again, have a nice dinner and get to pack. Um, we appreciate the Children's Hunger Project and what they do for our students, uh, feeding them on the weekends. Uh, this morning, I got to participate in Central Middle School's Stomp Out Bullying Walk. We walked from the West Melbourne Police Department all the way to Central, and we had at least a couple hundred students show up wearing red, walking down Main Road in West Melbourne, Minton, and just uh, hearing some inspirational, inspirational uh, speeches by our mayors, and just had a great morning and proud of them for the work uh, that their teachers are doing to help them in that initiative, too. This Saturday, is the marching band music performance assessment. And I wanna invite the rest of the board as well as the listening audience to come out to Mel High. Um, they start at three o'clock. Um, I will try to publish the schedule on my Facebook page this week um, because it goes all the way up to eight. The last band performs at 8.30. So if you wanna know which band you wanna come see or if you wanna stay there for the whole day, it's gonna be a wonderful day of music there um, at, for their competition, but I encourage the rest of the board to come as well and, and check out uh, the great work that our marching bands have been doing. I had one thing I was gonna say for the board report, but I'll just say it now since it's gonna be a long night. Uh, met uh, my every other month meeting with uh, Russell Brun from Government Community Relations. The PAFR, which is the Public Annual Financial Report, is coming out soon, or popular, I think it's popular. Um, it's going to be so popular, everybody's going to want to look at it. The very first one that we've ever done, it will be a layman's view at our very complicated budget and, um, and finances and all of that. And so it's, uh, the initial look at it has been really great and uh, look forward to seeing that in the coming months. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. I'll Susan? I'll go after Jen. Jenkins, did you have anything? Mr. Susan? Yeah, so I wanted to thank Dr. Mullins and Russell Broom. Um, we're getting ready to do something extraordinary. Many individuals know that this COVID problem that we've had for a while has put a lot of kids on the couch. A lot of kids are sitting back and they're just lethargic. They're not getting out. They're not doing what they should do. And also at the same time, we have one of the worst workforce shortages in the United States in the last 50 years. So what I'm going to do in Russell Broom setting it up is that we're going to do tours of our career and technical programs. I'm going to go in and show you exactly what's inside of there. I'm also going to call on the industry that surrounds each one of those programs. So at O'Galley, I'll be reaching out to all the automotive companies and shops and everything else so that they can then view and see what we have. Because the next step is, is that we have on the job training. We have opportunities for these kids to get out and work. And if our parents know that the opportunities are there, if those shops and those organizations, whether that's the aviation hangar over there at O'Galley High School, those students that are going into Melbourne Regional Airport and working at some of those, each one of those sectors should be driving each one of our kids to get jobs inside of them. And if they know where the students are, they know the actual teacher, they'll be able to do that. So I wanted to thank Dr. Mullins and Russell Broom for getting ready to set it up and it looks like we'll probably start it in my district and then I hope my other school board members follow suit. It's going to be a great opportunity to show off our stuff and get these kids back to work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Susan. Dr. Mullins. Thank you, Ms. Belford. I want to uh, first recognize our student services department and our ESE teachers, our ESE specialists. Florida recognizes uh, schools who establish a high quality MTSS process that stands for the multi-tiered system of supports that is in every one of our schools and responds to the needs of kids, academic, behavioral, and so on, to provide the identified supports. 
Well, the state allows schools to uh, uh, submit application to recognition of a school of high quality MTSS. There were only 59 school applicants across the entire state of thousands of schools, and Brevard is being uh, has one of the awarded schools. Only 20 schools met all three criteria, which and uh, so congratulations to Quest Elementary School for not only going through the rigorous application process, but being uh, only one out of three applicants who received the the award across the state. So congratulations to Quest, the staff who made that possible, as well as our entire student services team that comes around them and supports them to do the work of supporting our students. And then if that's not enough, I'm gonna kind of tout on Brevard Public Schools dominating the state. This last Saturday, the Florida Council for Social Studies, for Social Studies had their annual awards program this last Saturday night, and we took so many of the awards that night. It's gonna take you a minute to go through them, but these are state recognized uh, educators and instructors of social studies. First, the Warren Tracy Beginning Teacher of the Year Award was awarded to Stephanie Booth at Jefferson Middle School. Congratulations, Stephanie. Yeah, let's hear it. You're gonna clap a lot, because there's more. J.R. Scredding Leadership Award to Jennifer Jolly at Palm Bay Magnet High School. State recognition. The Dr. Theron Trimble Florida Teacher of the Year Award, high school recipient. We took that one. Francine Dravick at Space Coast Junior Senior High School. And then the Dr. J. Doyle Castile Outstanding Leadership Award. This is a big deal. We took that award with uh, and awarded to Miss Kimberly Garten, who we've said her name a half a dozen times up here on the dais, as she is our secondary leading and learning resource teacher for social studies. Congratulations, no surprise to Kimberly Garten. So I think the other 66 districts across the state had to share a couple other awards that we didn't take, but that's okay. Um, Dr. Mullins, it's funny that you said that. So when I was a teacher, I won the Warren Tracy Beginning Teacher of the Year for the whole state of Florida, and Ms. Drabick was one of the ones that taught next door to me. And the individuals that you have for social studies inside this county leads the state, and you should be very, very proud of them for that. Uh, Ms. Drabick's an amazing teacher, and I just had to make a plug for her. I mean, I sat across the hall from her for six years, so good stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Susan. Um, and that is a good lead-in for me. Um, wanted to um, thank Dr. Stephanie Sullivan and Ms. Jane Klein for an awesome workshop earlier today um, where we really dug into uh, the academics in our district, where our challenges are, and laid out our plans to address those challenges. So for our public, if you did not have an opportunity, I know we have a couple that were here with us earlier, and thank you for being here and engaging. Um, but if you did not get an opportunity to watch it, uh, I would certainly encourage that you do so because um, there's lots of great data and lots of great explanation as to how we move forward successfully. Um, tying into social studies, because one of the areas that we are very strong in Brevard County is in fact social studies. And so um, I think it's a, it's a testament to the work that those people have done that we can share that data. I also want to thank our students and our parents, uh, as well as our faculty and staff for the commitment and determination to work together to bring down our COVID numbers. Over the past several weeks, we heard numerous times that there was no way we would get to 50 cases per 100,000 over a seven day period in our community. As you know, this past Friday, we came in at 50.1. Perhaps even more impressive and more on point with my appreciation for our school community is that our in-school cases have dropped to nearly half of what our community cases have been per 100,000 people. That's an amazing feat considering that at the end of August, our cases in schools were two and a half times that of our community. I will not claim that the masks are the sole cause of this decline, as we know we had a decline in our community, but I don't believe that we can say they had no impact either, given the much steeper decline in our schools than in our community. Other mitigation strategies like staying home when sick, social distancing when possible, and additional cleaning protocols also likely contributed to our steep decline. 
So I don't want to overlook the fact that everyone truly contributed to our ability to have reached the 50.1 in the community and 29.9 in our schools. So on behalf of everyone who sacrificed to make this happen, we appreciate you. I look forward to more discussion later in the meeting about what our next steps are. All right. Dr. Mullins, that is going to bring us to the adoption of the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. On this evening's agenda, we have administrative staff recommendations, two presentations, 20 consent items, 12 action items, and two information items. Changes made to the agenda since it was first released to the public on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, are as follows. A presentation on issues facing teachers and strategies for improvement was added. A revision was made to item G40 on procurement solicitations and item F12 on student expulsions as well as item G38 on extension of emergency mask policy and a board discussion item were additions. What are the wishes of the board? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. McDougall. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Only when I try to vote twice. I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming that was an A. Okay. I, it, no, it didn't show me. And the motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins, will you please let us know about the administrative staff recommendation? Ms. Belford and members of the board, there are three individuals for the board to consider. What are the wishes of the board? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. McDougall. Is there any discussion? Dr. Mullins? Oh, we should vote first, sorry. Please vote. <laughs> <laughs> The motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins? Thank you, Mrs. Belford. Members of the board, uh, if, I, if I were honest, I wish you actually would have denied the first individual I'm going to recognize. Uh, but nevertheless, I want to congratulate Mr. Frank O'Leary as he retires at the end of this semester calendar year from the position of principal at Apollo Elementary School. Mr. O'Leary has a long-standing career in Brevard Public Schools. We commend him for his dedication, his service, and certainly personal sacrifice to putting kids first and taking care of not only kids, but the parents in, our, in his immediate community and the schools he, he has served over the many years. We appreciate you, Frank. Uh, we wish you well, and we appreciate you sticking with us through the end of this, uh, this semester, but uh, we wish you a most blessed retirement. And coincidentally, uh, and, and to our fortune, we have another former administrator who retired a little while ago and apparently has failed at retirement because he agreed to come back as acting assistant principal at Delora Middle School. Mr. Doug Cook, you may recognize him as a long-standing assistant principal uh, from Satellite High School, but uh, he, I, I see him at every Satellite event uh, uh, that goes going on in the community. He remains very active, and he's agreed to come back as a uh, acting assistant principal, effective November 1st through January 14th. So Doug, welcome back to the team. It's good to have you and uh, appreciate you coming to help us out. Thanks, Dr. Mullen. All right, we are going to move on to presentations and I am super excited for this first one. Dr. Mullins, if you'd like to share. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the board. I'll be providing a presentation on our Thrive by Five initiative. I know you think, wait, 
we've been hearing about this, and you have, but tonight is the eve of our official hard launch of the Thrive by Five program. I have Ms. Klein and Ms. Priscilla Danino, who's going to join me over here while I make a presentation to the board and uh, to our public. All right. Is the microphone on? I can't tell. It is not. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So first, I'd like to begin by introducing the lovely, talented, amazing Priscilla Danino, who is our uh, coordinator of early childhood. Did I get that right? Um, she, I've known Miss Danino for years. She is an exemplary educator, but truly an expert in early childhood and has been instrumental in our development of this initiative under the great leadership of Ms. Jane Klein, who you heard from earlier today, uh, the Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Leading and Learning. So to, to get us started, maybe, see if we can, there we go, now the computer's away. What we know and understand, and I don't think will be a surprise to our community, is the, the absolute critical importance of early learning really the develop the literacy development of children at day one of birth and then we we know that in the first five years of life it is absolutely critical to the overall lifelong development of a child into adulthood and if you've raised a child you know those early years they are moving fast they are learning fast and they're making us move fast um, in fact they develop more than one million neuron connections per second. I wish I could say the same still for me. <laughs> but um, their brains are wired from the moment uh, of birth to get ready to learn for the rest of their lives. And their, their neurons are just uh, firing at accelerated rates. So we began discussion, how do we capitalize on those early years of a child's life to really lay the foundation of solid literacy acquisition. And we, we wanted to, we discussed a way, how do we support families? How do we connect with our families in those earliest stages of life to give them resources and tools and um, connections with how to support their child in liter uh, with literacy? Because we know if we can help families with the, the development of literacy by five, when a child comes into our schools in kindergarten, reading what we call reading ready, then the trajectory of that child's literacy accomplishment uh, is, is on pace and on track for our teachers when, when the child comes to our schools. So how do we, how do we be a partner in that early journey? and developing and fostering a love for learning, but also a love for literacy. So that is what was the impetus behind Thrive by Five. We began development of a website and a logo design, and then we went out to our community health partners because the reality is, is we wait right now for the kids to walk into our schools at four years old for VPK or five years old for kindergarten, and it's a, we don't know who those families are until they walk in our doors. But our health partners who have the birthing centers, they have the very first introduction to kids in the community. We said, if we can connect with our health partners and our birthing centers and get resources and uh, supports in the hands of families and then develop that relationship in the coming years, we can not only uh, help the parents in, in developing that love for learning and literacy, but also be a partner with them along that journey. So launching soon, actually official hard launch on Monday, November 1st, is our Brevard Thrive by Five website, where I, I love this quote. I think this is actually Ms. Danino's quote, so got to give her the credit. Watching your child grow and develop is like turning a kaleidoscope. Each lens you look through shows you something different. With that in mind, we knew we had to create and develop a dynamic website. 
As you can see, the tabs at the bottom of the screen, they represent all of the different resources that are, gonna, that are available on our website for families. So you may, may ask, well, how are you gonna connect with these families? You've talked about the healthcare, the birthing centers, and so on. We have, Ms. Danino, will you hold up one of our resource bags? We have to put together uh, with our, our local hospital partners, this resource bag that will be delivered to the hospital birthing centers, and they have agreed to, make, to give them to families when they have a child in their, in their hospital. The family can review that, take advantage of the resources, be introduced to our website, but also if you'll open one up so everyone can see, we want to give them their maybe their first book, their first uh, early childhood book, uh, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I, we, we still have it in our house from years ago. We're waiting to use it with grandkids. Hint, hint. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm going to get in trouble for that one. Yes, you are. Um, but also we have a, uh, a bib or a towel for our families that uh, celebrates the, the birth of their child and connects them with Thrive by Five. I have to do a huge, huge shout out to our three major health partners in our community, Parrish, Stewart Medical Group, and Health First. I made a phone call to each of the CEOs in the organization and I said, you know, we're, we, we've got this crazy idea of connecting with all the families who are having kids in our community every year, every day throughout the year. The problem is I don't know who they are, but you do because they come through your birthing centers. Would you allow us to provide for you? We'll put them together, uh, these resource packets, uh, bags for families. And immediately, it was the quickest absolute yes I've ever received from a business partner in the community. And not only have they given us access to the birthing center, but every one of the health partners made a financial contribution <clears throat> and have virtually offset the entire cost of this initiative and made uh, a five-year commitment to continue doing that for our community. So we launched a, a packing day a couple, three weeks ago. A bunch of uh, staff got together and put together the first, I think it was 500, 200, 500 bags. They're ready to be delivered out in our birthing centers. You see the bins there, they're all ready to go. The plan, we will continue to pack. We may be having co-packing parties with Children's Hunger Project and then also our Thrive by Five, but we'll re-fill uh, the bins, re-deliver them to our birthing centers so they can continue to make those resources available to um, our families. So what does the community launch look like? Monday, November 1st, uh, you will be uh, getting information or, or announcement of our news conference that we'll be doing with our health partners, uh, making that announcement formally to our entire community. Um, and then we'll also be having a social media event with BPS and those partners moving forward. You're going to start to see billboards and the Thrive by Five logo beginning to prompt people's interest and uh, attention to this initiative. And then we're launching our podcast uh, on Monday as well uh, through our social media sites. So stay tuned for more Thrive by Five information coming near you and would encourage you to um, show those families that you know with young kids or soon to be families to our website and the resources that are available. As we move into the, the uh, coming months, <clears throat> phase two of our launch will be more bags being delivered to hospitals and birthing centers across the county. We know that there are other locations other than the hospitals um, that we are connecting with and providing the resources of them as well billboards throughout the entire month of uh, November, as well as continuing to build business partners. Our municipalities, I've been out meeting with our municipalities over the last uh, few months, and I've been dropping these hints of Thrive by Five is coming soon. Do you want to be a part of this initiative? And undeniably, yes, how do we get, how do we connect? I said, well, the first thing you can do is you can join us in passing a resolution, and we're going to present that to the board here in just a few minutes in committing to be a community supporting families and committed to early literacy. And it is my vision, my, my true hope that Brevard County be, is a, becomes a place 
that no matter where a family goes, whether it's the grocery store, the dentist, the hair salon, or the, or the drug store, that they see images and reminders of, we as a community surround you and uh, support you in the uh, developing your child for the love of learning and a love for literacy, and we're going to help you ensure they thrive by five, and we can send them on to a very positive and amazing journey the rest of their K-12 years in Brevard schools. So we will continue to stay in touch with our families uh, through at least the th first birthday with another book to our families. So we uh, will be setting up a way for families to connect through our website, but we're also, I make Mr. Bruin a little nervous, I give this disclaimer every time, but uh, we're in the early stages of development of a Thrive by Five app. I'm speaking it into existence. <laughs> um, so that our families have that interactive connection with Thrive by Five and we can push out new information to them because as we know, those stages change fast in, uh, in a kid's life. So we'll be uh, making that available to our families as well. And uh, resources, again, the, the website will be dynamic and, and developed along uh, helping families through the entire development of their, of their kid. So happy to answer any questions at this time uh, of the board uh, before I ask Mr. Broom to come up and read the resolution for the official launch of Thrive by Five. I know you're thinking, finally, COVID <laughs> got in the way, but no more. Anybody have any questions or comments for Dr. Mullins? Ms. Campbell? So I hope that you get to include us on the packing invitations because I think this is a great opportunity um, to get the community involved. And just like, you know, you mentioned Children's Hunger Project, you know, that's a great way just to get, let people know what we're doing and to get volunteer hours and all that. It would be great for students, high school students, hint, hint. Those of you who have high school students that need to earn those hours. But I, I love that, and I hope we continue to involve the community in this initiative. It's wonderful. We are going to need the community's help. I, I alluded to we packed 500 bags. I, you, maybe someone was going to ask, how many births do we have a year in Brevard? Well, right now, it's over 5,000. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So we've got a few more bags to pack just to get ready for this year. So we, we need you. Anyone else? Ms. Jenkins? Thank you, Dr. Mullins, and everyone who is a part of this initiative. Um, obviously, I have a passion working with kiddos from birth to five years old, so this hits right at home for me. Um, I love your app idea, and um, hopefully, you know, as that starts to get developed, maybe we can incorporate my, my old department and Child Find and, and uh, create some access for families who really think they might need some support and early intervention for their students, and so we can catch those kiddos sooner, sooner than later and, and make sure our kiddos are on par when they come in for kindergarten. Absolutely. Thank you. Great suggestion. Thank you. Ms. McDougall, oh, yes. um, well, you know how I was always excited about this program, and I'm so thankful. So I'm glad that we are here and kicking it off. And again, Jane, thank you for your department and for making this a reality. And yes, I have passed out the bags you gave me. And these are so much nicer than the ones we first had. So I'm excited about this. This <laughs> so is the Gen you. 2 bag. <laughs> five by five, 2.0? Yep. Got it. Mr. Susan. Yeah, I, I um, you know, it, it, it gets me in my gut when I see um, what we give the new mothers. Uh, I have five children, and being inside the hospital during those times, you can look down the, the, the hallway, and there's always one uh, mother that doesn't have people coming in. We had restrictions that were uh, throughout the years that um, in the beginning, years ago, you could bring half the city inside your room and lately it's only a couple of people. But it's a sad thing when there's a single mom in there and not to have that support at home. And this is a nice thing to do, it really is. And I think what we need to do, Dr. Mullins, you made a great speech and brought levity to the whole situation, but the reason we're stepping in is because it's a serious thing. And these kids need help. When we had COVID hit and we were feeding those kids on mobile, mobile units to just make sure that they got fed, there's kids out there that, that because Children's Hunger Project feeds and, and they are such at a disadvantage. So anything we can do with everything we have, I appreciate it, Dr. Mullins. That's all. I just wanted to say that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? I will just echo the appreciation, Dr. Mullins. I know this was kind of your brainchild, uh, making it a strategic priority. And 
Um, I, you know, working with the little ones myself, I, I know the uh, ability for them to learn at those young ages, even amazing things. And so uh, I'm super excited that we're going to be taking advantage of that learning opportunity during those years. Um, but would echo Mr. Susan's sentiments about realizing the need in our community and how this truly can, you know, thinking back about the student data that we looked at today um, and those fragile subgroups that we looked at. Um, I, I really think that this has the potential to impact, you know, how, how they start off and what that data looks like for them for a long time. So thank you. If there's no other questions, I'll ask Mr. Brune to come up. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't do a huge shout out to Mr. Brune and his team as well in district communications. You know, the, these are the experts in early childhood. These are the experts in communications and really framing everything from logos to messaging to how to launch this. Uh, he has just stepped up to the, to the call and the charge and done a fantastic job. Deborah Foley, who went out and really sealed the deal with our health partners to bring in tens of thousands of dollars annually to support the, this initiative. Uh, is no small feat. So, Mr. Brune, we appreciate your leadership and appreciate your department. Good evening. I also want to give a, a, a thank you to Cat Allen from my department, who did a great job with this as well. <clears throat> Here we go. Whereas, from the time a child is born, he or she is learning every waking moment. In fact, babies and toddlers are either learning or they are sleeping. And between birth to age five, a child learns at a speed unmatched the rest of his or her life. It is during these years when more than 85% of a child's brain is formed, creating crucial brain connections. Whereas Brevard Thrive by Five will raise awareness about early childhood literacy and development, and whereas Brevard Thrive by Five will connect with new parents in Brevard County when they leave the hospital or hospital birthing center with their new baby, and whereas Thrive by Five gives Brevard families a central place to find resources, information and best practices for their children from birth to age five, and whereas the initiative helps provide a pathway for every family in Brevard to learn about the importance of early literacy beginning at birth, and whereas Brevard Thrive by Five encourages a spirit of collaboration with healthcare supporters, business partners, local cities, civic organizations, and community leaders to serve Brevard families and their children, and whereas research has proven that early childhood literacy is a key factor to, to future success in an education journey, and whereas students who are behind when they start kindergarten make up the largest portion of school dropouts, having less than a 12% chance of attending college, and whereas Thrive by Five specifically supports goals outlined in the strategic plan of Brevard Public Schools, and whereas it is recognized that when children are engaged in school, the community reaps many benefits, including lower crime rates, an educated workforce, a highly rated public school system, and an attractive location for both employers and employees to reside. Be it resolved on October 26, 2021, that the Brevard Public School Board publicly acknowledges the Brevard Thrive by Five initiative as one that utilizes a unique collaboration and support the large network of supporting members that make up our community together, working together to serve Brevard families and their children and help every child in the county thrive by five. Thank you, Mr. Brune. What are the wishes of the board? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. The suspense is killing me. I just got to <laughs> tell you, I had, I had to break the silence. And the motion passes 5-0.
Thank you, school board. Appreciate your support and appreciate you journeying through this with us over the last many months uh, to this reality. A uh, sincere and genuine thank you to our health partners and your commitment not only to give us the opportunity to make this available to our, our new families, but also partnering with us financially. If I can take one additional privilege, it's such, been such a long journey, can I ask the board to come out front? We're going to give you a bag, we take a picture. Mr. Bruin, we should have put on our, our mission statement to serve every future student with excellence, <laughs> but maybe you can Photoshop that in for our social media launch. Is there a copy of the preamble in there? Is there a thing in there? <laughs> That's what I would do. Frame that. Is the Constitution? Oh, there's a t-shirt in here? You guys get a t-shirt? I got a t-shirt. You can get a t-shirt. It's not going to fit you. Yeah. Extra large. <laughs> All right, Dr. Mullins, we are back to you when you are ready, sir. Next, we will hear a presentation from the Brevard Federation of Teachers, BFT, on issues facing teachers and strategies for improvement. Mr. Anthony Colucci, BFT president, will be providing the presentation. Good evening, board. My name is Anthony Clucci. I'm the president of the Brevard Feder Federation of Teachers. Tonight I'll be discussing issues facing teachers and strategies for improvement. As you are aware, this year has been extremely challenging for our teachers. I realize that this is not just a Brevard problem. This is a Florida problem, probably a national problem as well. But we are here representing Brevard's teachers. There are approximately 160 instructional vacancies this year, and I'm not going to go into the weeds, whether it's 210 or 110, there's a lot of classrooms without teachers right now. We've seen 208 <coughs> resignations on board agendas this year, and 825 resigned or retired last year. It is an understatement to say that our teachers are worn out and overextended. The alarm bell for us was that the most common question we're getting in the office right now is what is the district's policy for resigning? The greatest failure is the failure to try. I am not a consultant. I am not gonna stand up here and say I have a silver bullet to fix these issues. I'm not going to do that. If I use the word solution tonight, it was a mistake because I'm talking about strategies for improvement. But doing nothing or little is certainly not going to help. The strategies for improvement that we're suggest suggesting should come as no surprise to staff. We've been advocating for many of these items for months. What we're seeking tonight is that this board uses its authority to direct Dr. Mullins to implement these strategies within the timelines BFT is suggesting. Based on qualitative feedback from members, emails, phone calls, meetings, school visits, we've identified three big issues. 
Our union over, of over 3,000 dues-paying members is the voice of our teachers. As a board, you need to take that seriously. As the elected representative of the teachers, I'm offering viable and practical ideas that can be implemented quickly. We are seeking to be a solution-driven union, but we can only do so if the board is willing to act. My hope is that the presentation is not you listening to me and moving on without acting. I'm asking that this board commit to these actions and the timelines I presented. The first issue we've identified is a lack of coverage. There are not enough teachers. There are not enough subs. Earlier in the year, due to COVID, we had a ton of teacher absences. Teachers are being pulled from their planning periods or their actual jobs to cover. This can be multiple times per week. We've heard of teachers losing their planning periods for the entire week. This is a big problem for all, including our ESE teachers who are unable to write IEPs during the school day, to our resource teachers down here at ESF who are missing several days a month to cover classes at schools, which is preventing them from doing the jobs they were hired to do. The second issue that we have identified is student discipline. Our teachers are dealing with unruly students, students hitting and eloping, and being overall difficult and non-compliant. The third issue is morale. This pandemic is only a year and a half old, but this is the third school year that our teachers are dealing with the impact of COVID. It hangs me to say it, but many teachers don't feel good about teaching right now. You know, the excitement is waning. There's a sense that it's not worth it. And they're looking and seeing job opportunities elsewhere. Without a doubt, all these issues have an impact on one another. We must try to improve in these areas. We must try. If there's a silver lining in all these issues, it's that improvement in one area will help improve the others as well. So what I'm gonna offer now are some strategies for improvement, things that we think can be done quickly to help with these various issues. So as for the issue of coverage, the first thing we'd like to see done is one of our directors meet with all teachers that put in their two weeks notice. And we think this should be done immediately. And by this, I'm saying a teacher says, I'm going to resign, turns in their paperwork to the school secretary or principal, they alert the director of that school, the director has a face-to-face -face meeting with that teacher. And what we believe can happen here is that these directors can provide help to these teachers, these teachers can be heard, and we can stop the bleed. We can stop the bleed, because if we, we know if that teacher goes, that teacher is not going to be easily replaced. So the the better move is to make sure that teacher doesn't leave in the first place. And we know that we can prevent these teachers from leaving because we do it all the time in our office. We do it every day in our office. We help teachers stay in Brevard County and get the help that they need. We are asking that our secondary teachers are, uh, are informed by the end of November of the possibility that they could be working seven out of seven. Uh, meaning that they would give up their planning period for the optional class stipend, which is $3,509. This is a Band-Aid, I understand, um, but there may be teachers that are interested in doing this for that supplement. You also have it within your power to increase that supplement using the ARP funds, because this would fall within the scope of, of that grant funding. Even if five teachers take us up on this because a memo was sent. That's five classes that don't need to be covered uh, uh, every day. The next thing we believe will help with coverage is to ensure an equitable rotation, and we're asking that this is also uh, completed by the end of November. What we're asking is the directors of each school request and review with the principal the the schedule they have for coverage to make sure that it's being done in an equitable manner. What I mean by this is it should not be 
Ms. Jenkins being called to cover every day while Mr. Susan sits in the lounge eating potato chips, all right? <laughs> Pro probably would be a true story, just saying. So, you know, just we want to make sure <laughs> that this is being done fairly. We believe in most case it is, cases it is. And we also are very grateful to the many, many administrators who are jumping in on this rotation schedule. We're asking that administrators are flexible with, uh, are generous with flex time, comp time, and personal time. We believe that this could be implemented by the end of November once again. Perhaps the principals get the information at a leadership meeting or a memo. And what we mean by this is um, we're not talking about providing comp time and personal time. We're talking about using it. There are actually some caveats in our contract about using these benefits. For instance, personal time currently requires that teachers take a half, at least a half a day, and comp time requires a request two days in advance. So what we're saying, it's better for a teacher to miss an hour or two if they need to get run an errand rather than miss a half a day. So we ask that principals are more flexible on that. And finally, we have increased subpay. We believe that you guys can implement this by January. Uh, I recently heard from an administrator that it wasn't until this month that their first sub picked up at the school, until October. They've not been able to secure a sub. I was talking to a substitute the other day, and she pointed out that her high school students are making more money than she is in her part-time in, in their part-time jobs. We know we have, we have to get to $15 an hour. I believe you guys have five years to get there. And what I'm suggesting is get there sooner. You have to get there, get there sooner. It cannot hurt to pay people more money to do the job. And you have the ARP money available to help you reach that point as well. Strategies for improvement for discipline. First and foremost, we need to make sure all our schools are following the district's discipline plan. And we believe that should happen by the end of November once again. You know, lots of hard work and important work to ensure equity and reasonable corrective actions have gone into the discipline plan over the past five years. BFT has been a part of those efforts. It's been really disappointing to learn that some schools are using minor infraction forms instead of referrals. Often these infraction forms prevent a teacher from writing a referral until the student commits the same offense four times. And according to our discipline plan, some of these infractions are level one and level two offenses. Teachers must have the ability to write referrals to ensure an appropriate learning environment for students. And it's extremely important for BFT and BPS to ensure it's being done correctly so we can properly track discipline. We're also asking that the referral process is reviewed with all administrators and teachers. That could happen through principals meetings and staff meetings by the end of November. It seems that some of our new teachers do not even understand what the process is to write a referral. And perhaps some administrators don't know to return a processed referral back to the teacher for them to review. We're asking that clear guidelines and communication surrounding the placement of students with disabilities be created by the end of November. Um, we're asking that the ESE department creates this, some kind of um, guideline, infographic, something, because what we know is there can be a long and drawn out process with seemingly no finish line to get a student the appropriate staffing that they need. Oftentimes we have a student who is placed in one setting and the teachers feel strongly that the, that is not the appropriate setting. They collect data, they collect more data, they collect more data, and never seems to get to the point where this student is, is moved. So we're looking for clear guidelines on that. Finally, we're asking that the district use its ARP money to hire additional district peer mentors, behavior analysts, and school counselors, as well as provide more district-based PD in this area. 
Um, <clears throat> In these tough times, some of our teachers may need additional support, including district peer mentor teachers and behavior analysts. We have three district peer mentor teachers who are trying to get to approximately 80 schools. They might have several teachers at each of those schools that need support. If we have more of those folks, we will be able to provide the support that these teachers need and hopefully provide them the help they need with discipline and keep them in the classroom. We also believe that more district-based professional de development should be offered. I'm just gonna say that the BFT believes that the school-based professional development is not working. Uh, teachers used to run to PD when it was district-based. Since it's been school-based, they now run from it. And this has been an ongoing issue. We also know that school counselors, more school counselors need to be hired to deal with post-pandemic issues concerning mental health and social issues. And that could be done using ARP funding. We realize it is difficult to hire right now, so we've put in a uh, start of next school year for, for that. In the area of morale, we have several strategies for improvement. First is to recognize and appreciate the circumstances in which teachers are working immediately. That could start right here tonight. This can't be said enough, you know, and it, the message we might tell our teachers is maybe we can't fix it, but we're gonna at least acknowledge it. We know that this is hard. There is no easy fix. And we are aware and thankful of your contributions. We all need to be saying that until we are blue in the face. They need to hear that we know what they're going through. We're asking that we put student achievement second to student and staff well-being immediately. I want to clarify this. The BFT believes in the importance of student achievement. But we believe the best way to achieve this is with a happy and full, fully staffed workforce. For instance, I heard from an ESE teacher yesterday that the other ESE teacher at her school resigned, which puts the entire workload on her. She is now scared and overwhelmed and thinking of resigning herself. What I'm saying is in this situation, making sure that teacher feels supported will result in greater student achievement than stressing about data or pacing guides. In other words, we believe students with, with teachers will outperform those without teachers. And those with happy teachers will outperform those with miserable teachers. There's seemingly too much pressure from the top to bring scores up. We need to take a breather with this new reading curriculum and recalibrate our expectations of its implementation. It is putting many teachers over the edge. Another suggestion for improvement we have is an easy one. Jeans Day, every week. Monthly, district-wide spirit days. We can implement these things almost immediately. The FT is willing to publicize those things. It's Simple things. Now, uh, am I saying that by wearing jeans, all these problems are going to go away? No, but I'm saying it's a little token, uh, token of appreciation to our teachers. You know what? You're killing yourself. Wear jeans tomorrow. I, well, when I was a teacher, I would have been glad to hear that so I didn't have to go home and iron my pants at night. All right? It's, it's the little things like that. We're asking um, that administrators start using some of their early release days for team building. We believe they can start implementing this in November. Team building can't just be a one and done. Oftentimes we have schools doing team building during pre-planning and that's the end of it. it the uh, team building should be fun and bring staff together. Next, I have, our next suggestion for improvement is an optional extended day, and we believe that could be implemented by the end of November. Once again, we have this ARP funding, and we can use ARP funding to pay teachers for the work they're already doing by being compensated for an extra hour a day 
What I'm saying is if these teachers are on campus, if they are grading papers, meeting with students, calling parents, writing IEPs, and we can't hire additional folks to do that work like that grant funding allows us to, well, let's compensate the folks who are doing that work. We are asking that the morale committee is revived by the end of November. Some of you might remember we used to have a morale committee. We used to have a regular jeans day. You might remember we had an employee picnic several years back. Those ideas came through the, the employee morale, morale committee. Once again, BFT is willing to help with this effort. Next suggestion is let teachers periodically leave with students. We believe this could be done um, starting in November. My guess is many of our veteran administrators probably are already doing this. Many of our newer administrators are nervous about doing something like this without being, having permission granted to do so. Idea here is simple. You're working hard. You're working a lot. You have an enormous amount of pressure on you. We're asking a lot from you. You know what? If you can, if you don't have something pressing to do, you can leave when the kids do. Go, go to Starbucks, get a coffee, go get a milkshake, go to the gym, go take a nap, whatever it is. It's these little things to show appreciation to our teachers that can go a long way. And then finally, we're asking to improve veteran teacher pay. That would happen at the bargaining table. Um, I know you are all very well aware of that issue and concerned about it, but a teacher coming into this district with 20 years of experience, if somebody leaves Orange County tomorrow and comes here, will be making $46,550, which is the exact same amount that a teacher who was very first day in the classroom tomorrow as well. Somebody like me who is a 22-year teacher, I'm only making three or $4,000 more than a brand new teacher. It doesn't quite give you a sense of excitement when you see that happening. And by no means am I suggesting that is this school board's uh, fault. We clearly know that it's legislation that has intensified this issue. What we're asking for you to do is find a way to, to help uh, get around what the state, the state has, has created. And finally, my ask right now is, will one or more of you champion one of these is issues, coverage, discipline, or morale, and work with BFT, Dr. Mullins, and staff to implement these ideas in a timely manner? Now, I know Matt's like, oh, yeah, my picture's first, you know, and what? yeah, we, we know, and Misty's going, why do I only have a half a circle there? And you know, it's just what it did when I pressed enter. Um, <laughs> these strategies for improvement from your teachers must be taken seriously and not get kicked to staff and hope they get done. This elected board must use its authority to ensure staff implement these ideas. I will take any questions that you may have. You want to have questions for Mr. Colucci? I just have something to say. Um, I'm sorry? I just have something to say. Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Colucci. Um, I think it's important for people who are watching to recognize that uh, BFT represents 60% of our teachers. Um, and so if we don't, whether or not we agree or disagree on things, if we don't take at least the opportunity to listen to what they're presenting, we're also not listening to 60% of our educators. So it's something really important that we need to kind of focus on. Um, and you know, something you've kind of touched across your entire presentation. Um, you know, we talk often about grace and flexibility over these past 18 months of COVID. Um, but I think it's really important for us to really remember, you know, the grace and flexibility that all of our staff has, has given um, their community, um, and it's time for us to 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 double down and, and recognize there are these little things that we can really make a huge difference when it comes to our educators uh, and make a huge difference in their lives. Um, so I appreciate you guys. You know, you know, I'm an ally, and I'm here to champion anything you need. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Jenkins. Anyone else? Ms. Campbell. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Colucci. And I, I have to tell you, I thank you for coming up with some ideas that don't necessarily cost money. 
Um, it's always to have, good to have a little a variety. Um, but really some great ideas. Um, I, you know, I'll jump right in here and, and be, I don't know if Ms. Jenkins may have beat me to it, and just say, you said you wanted us to immediately start saying thank you. And I will continue to say thank you to our teachers. I was just um, hearing, I saw a Facebook post this morning from a, a teacher who's very gentle and very positive all the time, but just shared her heart of what a tough uh, time it's been, especially over the last six months because of all the craziness in our public division. And sometimes that ire gets aimed at teachers because people say, oh, education, everybody, and it's a system and it's trying to uh, corrupt our children or whatever. And the truth is, the people who teach in our schools come from our community. They are a reflection of our community. And some of them are conservative and some of them are liberal. And, you know, they really have a tough time no matter which political leaning they have and they need our support. And so I'm very thankful. Um, and I am really thankful for our community who has stepped up, uh, our business partners, to say thank you to our teachers as well. Uh, I have a question for you about one of the very first things you mentioned. You, you chose... Uh, you, I was wondering why you picked the director to meet with those teachers who, who have given their two weeks notice. Because I know you guys get those calls, you said that. But i um, wondering why that particular, because uh, you know, who's going to be most effective to keep that person in the building? So I try to put Dr. Mullins there, but he tells me he's busy enough as okay. are <laughs> he is. Uh, Ms. Klein and, and Dr. Sullivan. So sometimes um, it, it's my belief that Oftentimes, these teachers have already discussed the issue with the principal and have felt like they didn't have relief from the principal, so that is the next person up from the principal. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out, you've mentioned the ARP funds a few times, but you know if you paid attention to the last board meeting that we don't really have control, we don't have access to that money, but we also, part of that is it has to be discussed by the community. So certainly, please encourage your teachers to access the portal, um, you know, and you guys as well, to put those ideas in there, because uh, certainly are some things that could, are possibilities as we dream big for that, those plans. I think, oh, you've mentioned more PD on the discipline slide, I believe. Mm -hmm. Do you have some specific topics that you are just general behavior management, classroom discipline kinds of things, or sp things specific to, our processes, I guess. Just general professional development on classroom management. We were surprised in a VFT meeting, even some of our veteran educators felt like they could benefit from more PD in, the, in this area because okay. of the challenging situation that they're dealing with. Okay. A particular format or time? You're talking about like Friday release, or Friday early release day, district professional development evenings, weekends? Well, when you um, step up to champion this area, we will discuss this specific. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm trying not to bargain away from the table. The other thing is, you know, we, it's time. That time professional development is, is precious. And I know um, we, but that's, I don't want to bargain away from the table about getting some of that time to do it. <laughs> so that's, that's all I've got for right now. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Susan, I feel like you're asking for the mic. Yeah, Anthony, there's nobody that was running in my school to PD day. I'm just not going to lie to you. Professional development was good, but it wasn't like we were running to it. Um, jeans, I love it. Uh, committees, yes. The only thing is, is that if we do a spirit day, one of them has to be a Florida State day. That's all I'm saying. So I am not going to allow it. It's going to go over well. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mullins will support me on that. But um, one of the things is, is you're right about the person that we go to for the next step is, is that there may be some internal conflict so that the director might be somebody to do that. One of the things you could do is do a Zoom meeting and record it so that others can use it for best practices and stuff like that. So if an individual is leaving and we need to find out what's going on and give them the opportunity, we can do something like that. Um, like you coming up, just the, the way it is, you know, you guys do represent 60% of the, you know, the teachers and you guys have done a good job throughout the years. Appreciate everything that you guys have done as a former teacher. I appreciate it. Um, and I look forward to working on some of these committees. 65%, but who's counting? Oh, sorry. So 65%. It's a big deal. Dr. Mullins, looks like you might want the mic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was going to save the, la the best for last. I, if 
it, but I don't need to jump in front of you if you would like to go next. You're good. Go right ahead. Well, Mr. Colucci and I have have had a, I would suggest a, a great relationship throughout my, throughout my superintendency, and we've we've had conversations around some of these concerns. Uh, several of them more recently. Um, I'm visiting schools more regularly. Thank you to board members for, for joining me and getting into our schools. And th the reality is, is Anthony, I, I agree with you. Um, our teachers have expressed these concerns. I met with my teacher of the year, uh, teachers of the year and finalists over the last three or four years as my superintendent's ambassadors actually last night. And we had discussion around the challenges that they're facing and, and they echoed some of these same things. Um, but so have our administrators. And I, I want to, and I think you alluded to that in your, your conversation, our administrators recognize the challenges that our teachers are facing. The shortage, I, Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we were talking about this in, in the last several days. We both predicted a teacher shortage crisis five years ago, five, six years ago. We didn't know it was going to be um, compounded by a global pandemic. But nevertheless, here is where we are. And, you know, we know within VPS and many of our parents and community understand that I would suggest that this is the most important and noble profession that we have is educating our youngest kids and raising them up to be the next generations of leaders that we want leading our communities and our country. And I would ask our community, I would echo uh, Anthony's charge to express the appreciation to our teachers and our administrators and our staff across the organization. Uh, Anthony, many of the things that you've suggested aren't just benefits to teachers, but they're important elements to consider for all of our employees. So I appreciate the charge to join the, the commitment. I will make the commitment to add these conversations to our monthly conversation that we have along with 1010 and BASA, but I'll also put it on uh, my meeting agendas with, with the board members. So the community understands I meet with board members one-on-one, -on -one, uh, at least formally every month, and we um, discuss uh, items along the way, and I'll add this to the agenda. So we keep it on the forefront, and we'll certainly continue to be talking as we move forward. Thank you. Can I jump in? Anthony, thank you very much for bringing this in. Um, I have two areas that I would be interested in working with you. Um, certainly discipline kind of goes with social emotional learning and um, morale. Both of those kind of in together, I think. So I certainly don't have a problem if the board doesn't have a problem with that, my fellow board members. Um, and thanks for bringing, I, I, I agree with what Ms. Campbell said is that it's not all um, about money. It's about what we can do to help. Um, e little things. It, it doesn't have to be something that's going to necessarily cost us a lot of money. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. Um, and Mr. Colucci, I, I think you know I'm, I'm there for wherever you need me to work on. Where you have a gap, feel free to stick me in. Um, I, uh, I know you started this presentation with a request for us to commit to following your timeline on all of the things that you put forward. And I don't think it will shock you to hear me say, um, I, I don't think as a board we can vote to adopt your timeline on all these issues without having conversations with Dr. Mullins and staff and understanding the ins and outs of all of, all of those things. Um, I will, however, um, continue to have those conversations with Dr. Mullins as, as we have our one-on-ones and check progress on those things. Um, and I'm happy to step in and help on any of the initiatives that you would like for me to do. So can we declare tomorrow Jean's day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll walk away with that. <laughs> Dr. Right. Mullins, are you opposed to a Jean's day tomorrow? Just tomorrow? I am not opposed to October 27th, <laughs> Wednesday, October 27th being for our public schools, <laughs> National Jean's Day. All there right. you go. There you go. Get it on Facebook here. Well, I so appreciate it's your job to get the word out, though. We will. You know, because I'm at, not on, assuming they're all watching this there. meeting. <laughs> Bruni's right there. Send it out, bro. Appreciate and, the time and the consideration, and I will be following up with you guys. And thanks for bringing the solutions. We appreciate that. Yeah, have a good yeah. night. Have a good night.
All right, board members, we are going to be moving into public comment. Um, we have approximately, well, not approximately, we have 26 speakers this evening. Um, I'm going to be asking for direction in a moment, but before we get too far in, uh, in direction, I just want to do a check-in and make sure, do we, do we need a break before we move into our just public comment? Short break for me. Okay, so if we could have just about a five-minute, right. Ms. Campbell? Yeah, I just have a question, because I know when we, when we do our policy adoption, we have a separate so are some of those going to be moved those times? Are we going to hear them all at the front? or? So Mr. Gibbs, well, okay, so I'll go ahead and give you guys the details. We have 26 speakers. We have eight that are not on agenda items. Okay. Um, we have... We have seven that look like they are going to be speaking on our public comment policy, but many of them are speaking about more than one thing. Um, so I'll call them up during public comment um, so they can speak to the other issue that they're speaking to. Um, and then, you know, would, would respectfully ask that they utilize that time to address all of their concerns. Um, so, but I, I mean, there's only eight of them not on agenda items, so. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So with that, are we good to take a five minute recess? All right. Okay. We will be back momentarily.
said one. He did say yeah. one? All right, we are back in session. Uh, board members, just for clarification, uh, I have a correction. We have 26 speakers. Nine of them are not on agenda items. The rest of them are on agenda items. So um, at this time, I will entertain a motion from the board as to how you'd like to handle those. Run them all. So is that a motion to take sure, all I move 26 to let everybody speakers? Yeah, I move to let everybody speak at once. Is there a second on Mr. Susan's motion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. All right, and the motion passes. Ms. Jenkins, I didn't hear yours. Aye. You? Okay, motion passes four to one. Okay. We are now at public comments. <clears throat> Each speaker is limited to three minutes. We have a clock in front of me to help you keep track of your time. When your time is over, you will be asked to stop and allow the next speaker his or her turn. Always keep in mind that reasonable decorum is expected at all times, and your statement should be directed to the board chair. The chair may interrupt, warn, or terminate a participant's statement when time is up. It's personally directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. Should an individual not observe proper etiquette, the chairman may request the individual leave the meeting. Let's all encourage an environment appropriate for our children who may be present or are watching from home. We will start with our first three speakers. And if you guys wouldn't mind kind of getting on deck over there for me. Uh, first three are going to be Katie Delaney, Karen Fulton, and Veronica Diaz. All right, Katie, whenever you're ready. Thank you. First, I want to thank the four board members who stayed through the entirety of the Achievement Gap and Curriculum um, workshop today. Um, it was great to kind of be involved in that and, you know, hear you guys. So I appreciate you guys who, who were there for that. Um, switching gears, I wanted to read a quote by Barack Obama. To those who qu cling to power through corruption and deceit and the silencing of dissent, know that you are on the wrong side of history, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench yours first. That being said, I'm hoping you all want to be on the correct side of history. Please let the illegal mask mandate expire. Even with the parental opt-out, it leaves room for forms to get lost and for children to be harassed and abused. Like sweet Sophia, BPS failed her. They abused her. That was made possible by this illegal mandate. I find it ironic that the union president got 40 minutes to speak while I am the union president of my students' union. And we deserve at least three minutes. This is an attempt to silence the public. Nothing more, nothing less. I watched the workshop, and all of you are in favor of this new policy. Having to pass something, having to pass something should never be a reason. Not videoing the meeting in its entirety will further the divide and continue, destroy, continue to destroy public trust. Now is not the time to limit speech. In our great republic, our founders called for robust debate. You are not our rulers. Frankly, the public should have more input, and there should be more back and forth. That is how we reach compromises and work together as a community. And I just want to comment on, um, you know, what was being said about how, how the masks help bring the numbers down. Two charter schools in this county had similar, if not better, COVID numbers, and they were mask optional, which... They had very little participation with masks. And I know that because my children go to one of those schools where almost no staff or children wear masks. We are now into our fourth week with zero COVID cases. So thank you. And I hope that you guys are on the right side of history. Thank you, Ms. Delaney. Ms. Fulton.
Hi, I have three things I'd like to address tonight. Um, first of all, I'm representing Moms for Liberty. I take that very seriously. I wear this shirt um, because I want to represent uh, this group of people that I've affiliated with. Um, in all of my experience with Moms for Liberty, there has been no discussion of anything inappropriate, no violence, no none of that. I've never heard anything like that. And I'm very disappointed that that has been, been brought um, against us. Um, I think if anyone had any proof of anything like that, they should bring it forward because that would be something that we would seriously have a problem with. Um, it's just not right to be accused of something that, it, that you're not a part of. Um, it breaks the bonds of trust. And I think I, I take that very seriously. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is, um, is, is another trust issue. Um, we want to build trust and we want to unite our community. We want to, um, we don't want to restrict parents' rights. I know you don't want to do that. We, we need to be a team. We need to work together. Um, and um, why would we restrict these, these, uh, these rights in a school board meeting? We have three minutes that we can speak. Uh, I think that that's something that we need to retain. And uh, not, not broadcasting the comments of parents uh, sends the message that what they have to say is unimportant. And I'm sure that we don't want to do that. Um, parents are feeling left out in the process of all of this, and that's not right. Parents are a part of the process. Um, the third thing I'd like to speak uh, about is something that's near and dear to my heart. And that is the, the little girl, Sophia. Um, you know, parents have this precious commodity of their children, and they send them to the school with a trust that you're, gonna, you're going to take care of those children. Um, it takes trust to be able to do that. In the case of Sophia, it takes an even greater trust. She's vulnerable. She can't express herself. Um, and so, uh, I'm very disappointed in the, uh, the, the situation with her. I have a 56-year-old brother with Down syndrome, and we have fought for him every day of his life. For 56 years, we have fought for him. When he started, there were no public schools for him, and we had to fight for that. And I strongly am very sad about what happened to Sophia. And I think it's the responsibility of the schools to make sure things like that don't happen. And ultimately, it's your responsibility as a board to make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. Osmus Diaz, Osmus Diaz is approaching. Our next three speakers will be um, Damani Hosey, Molly Williams, and Aaron Davison. Ms. Diaz? Hi, board. My name is Veronica Diaz, and I'm a mom of two children in BPS. I am new here, I just came from Miami about a year ago, and I have a background in medical social work for almost 20 years in a very large healthcare system. So wearing a well-fitted face mask is not a foreign concept to me. It was a requirement and an annual competency, uh, competency we had to complete every single year. But I'm not here today to talk to you about data or competencies because we all know that certain board members don't consider any of this when making its decisions. I'm here today as a terrified parent after learning about a young girl with Down syndrome in your district who had a mask forcefully tied around her head by her teacher, restricting her breathing and her ability to speak because of your mask mandate. It terrifies me to send my children to school knowing that someone charged with the responsibility of educating my child is capable of doing this to a child, is capable of doing this to someone. This alone should be evidence enough that the school board is not qualified to make the decisions over my child's bodily autonomy or health care. This task is the sole responsibility of the parent and their physician. The correct handling of masks is not always easy to achieve for medical staff, much less the general public. You can see everywhere that adults consistently fail to comply with necessary hygiene regulations when it comes to wearing a face mask. It's almost impossible to expect a teacher, and not fair actually, who has 20 students to monitor the compliance of necessary hygiene requirements that if not followed correctly can counteract as a possible hazard to our kids. I'm not anti-science or anti-vaccines. I'm going to blow your minds when I tell you right now that I myself am vaccinated for reasons that are none of your business. But I stand here for medical freedom, for the right to make our own decisions for ourselves and for our children. 
Almost two, year, two years into this pandemic with readily available vaccines, the issue of mandatory masking of our children should be a moot point. It's really not a surprise to any of us that this issue is obviously being driven by emotion and political agendas. And quite frankly, we the parents who fund the school system with our tax dollars have had enough of this charade. In closing, in order to restore faith and trust within our community, I respectfully ask the school board to acknowledge the abuse that has transpired in one of our schools to one of our students made possible by the illegal mass mandates and a sloppy institution of policy in which the school board has negligently instituted without properly instructing its teacher how to navigate. And I would like the school board to return the control of children's bodily autonomy to the parents. No more mass mandates. Indefinitely. Let our children be free. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hosey. Whenever you're ready, sir. My name is Damani Hosey, practice family physician with one child in Brevard Public Schools and two children in, in Florida Virtual School. I would like to thank those board members uh, who followed the science and instituted a mandatory mask mandate, a mandatory mask policy. The implementation of this simple public health measure has been an undeniable success. When masks were made mandatory, the average number of COVID cases in Brevard Public Schools per three-day reporting period dropped from 549 to 111. The average number of quarantines dropped from 2,998 to 413. To put it another way, there were five times fewer COVID cases and seven times fewer quarantines after the board ordered students and staff to be masked. The benefits of this policy likely extended beyond our school doors. Brevard's overloaded hospitals have seen a dramatic decline in COVID cases. This mirrors what we have known from, the, from countless scientific studies. Masks work and they work well. From a medical standpoint, the question of whether masks curb the spread of COVID-19 has been asked and answered, they do. But we must remain vigilant. Do not let success be the enemy of the good. It is not time to loosen mask mandates with opt-outs and exemptions. Our experience this summer and early fall has demonstrated the havoc that the Delta variant can reap if we do not have in place mandatory mask policy. <laughs> During the Delta surge this summer, COVID-19 hospitalizations among children nearly quintupled in the United States with 23% of hospitalized children being admitted to the ICU, and sadly, 2% of those uh, hospitalized children dying. According to the CDC, an estimated 46% of children hospitalized with COVID-19 had no known underlying conditions. In Brevard, between 95 and nearly 100% of all patients hospitalized with COVID-19 are unvaccinated. Our children are largely unvaccinated. COVID has the potential to devastate many families and it threatens our children and our community and needs to be taken seriously. Please reinstate the mandatory mask policy with no opt-outs until the pandemic is under better control and our children have at least the opportunity to be immunized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosey. <laughs> And audience members, I will just remind you that you should not be audibly responding during the public comment, okay? It's their time to speak. I, it's not your time to voice your opinion on what they're saying. So we need to be respectful and we need to let them have their time, okay? Uh, Molly Williams. Hi, Molly Williams. Our family resides in District 4. It's foolish to think someone can promise us safety. For the last year, you've been selling something that's impossible, and in the process, you managed to take away our parental rights. You haven't necessarily gone about this in a very wise way. You can shake your head all you want in disagreement that this has never been about our parental rights, but it has. And you stripped those rights from me and many parents so you could continue to sell something that you will never be successful at selling. I understand where you're coming from. I truly do. I've listened to you. I hear you. I also understand why your words, actions, and policies you put into place sound and look desirable to some parents, because who doesn't want safety, right? 
So when you say we are going to mandate masks and it's okay to disregard the law, it's okay to take away parental rights, and it's okay for the overreach, because if the kids just wear a mask for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, however long you want this to go on, then you will pull us into safety. But when I said that what you're selling is impossible, it's because you cannot give us that. Instead, it's just a false promise of safety. As an individual and as a parent, I stand firm in the fact that my family and I choose to rest in the best security. I stand firm in my freedom to make my own decisions that I believe are best for myself, my family, and my children. And I stand by the fact that I'm grateful I live in a state that gives me my right and freedom to my parental rights as it should be. Unfortunately, we've made our way down in, in an extremely ugly path. The relationship between the parents and the school board is in an ugly place. There are distractions throughout our districts keeping us from focusing on what's important. And the Brevard parents and Brevard school board are not being painted in a very good light. I'm fully aware of some policies that you will be voting on this evening. And based on how those, those votes go, we'll determine if you want to move forward or keep going down this nightmare of a path that we are on. I want to be an involved parent. I want to work with the school board. I am a volunteer and I am a room parent at my child's school. I want to be involved. Do you want involved parents? Do you want relationships with the parents of the children in your districts? Do you want that? Because seeing how certain issues have been handled and certain policies getting voted on, I'm just not sure if that's what you want. Full transparency from a parent who's new to public schools. This has been an embarrassment. It's a shame and it's a disgrace what's been happening. You certainly dealt our children a pretty crappy hand of cards for a while now, and to be honest, we're just done playing the game. Maybe one day we'll be able to get back to what's important. Maybe one day the school board and parents will be able to work together again like it's supposed to be. And if not now, I'm hopeful that one day we'll be able to do that. In the meantime, I am going to keep showing up. I am going to keep fighting for my children, and I am going to try my very best to get things done the right way. Thank you. Thank you. As Aaron's approaching, as Aaron is approaching, our next three speakers will be Elliot Davison, Julie Bywater, and Matthew Dolly. Aaron? I was super disappointed when I showed up tonight after checking the agenda every day, refresh, 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 and then seeing masking on it. I, was like, oh, I thought it would just expire, but here we are again. Um, so it was certainly interesting to hear about Thrive by Five tonight. And I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm guessing that nowhere in early liter literacy research will you find evidence to support that masking young children helps them develop in any way, especially with their early literacy. Um, in fact, I'm most certain you will find the opposite. I'm also um, shocked to see you want to continue the mask mandate for our youngest learners, especially after what allegedly happened to little Sophia at the school my kids are zoned for. I was on the call you had with the DOE regarding, regarding compliance a few weeks ago. They have the data. There's virtually no difference. I know you guys know this, but there's no difference with the numbers with all of the counties who did not have masking mandates and the few counties who did have masking mandates. So I, I cannot figure out what we're doing here. I'm asking that you reconsider continuing the mandate and end it immediately for everyone, including our teachers. You can tell by what BFT said, like teachers got enough junk going on. They don't need to be dealing with mask, mask discipline, discipline problems because of masking. Just end it, you can end it tonight. Um, I'm also asking that you continue to allow all public comment to be heard and to, be broad, and to broadcast the entire meeting including non-agenda public comment. When I can't come to a meeting, I have YouTube on and I'm watching. And I benefit so much from hearing the public comment and from hearing what people's concerns are or even getting ideas for like, oh, maybe we could learn more about this or I don't know about this. Like, it's just been really good and I know it's a benefit to the community and it also helps with that relationship between the board and between parents to keep an open line of communication, even if it is just broadcasting everything for us. So I do think the BFT had um, some great suggestions that sounded super reasonable. Our teachers do so much, and it certainly would be, would be great to see them supported, even if with just some little things. Um, Dean's Day is a super great start. So, all right, thank you guys. Thanks, Erin. Elliot?
Hi, I'm Elliot and I'm a Brevard Public School student. And as you are all probably well aware of the school shooting incident a few years ago where the fire alarm was pulled and everyone left. There, that was a safety policy that had to be changed because it was found that it didn't always work. Masking is a safety policy and I think that it should be changed because it has been proven over and over and you all know the data but that it does not work, so it can and should be changed. Um, I also wanted to speak on just being res like the board members being respectful to their audience, because I have seen board members on their phones, rolling their eyes, and I don't appreciate that, and I don't think anyone else here does. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. <laughs> Julie? Hello, I'm Julie Bywater with Moms for Liberty. Tonight I was supposed to speak on behalf of my senior son and all the seniors in the county about allowing the return of school sanctioned dances. Sadly, there are more pressing issues at hand. For example, the proposed limiting of public com comment. I wouldn't get the chance to be heard the way I am being heard tonight. With the amount of speakers typically that we have, I'd be limited to one minute at best. But since it will never be a consent agenda item, <coughs> dances, um, would likely be shoved to the end of the meeting with the video turned off. After all, why should I be heard? I'm just a mom. So much for encouraging parents to offer suggestions, which is exactly what I did when I spoke about homecoming dances being canceled. I gave you solutions, none of which were explored. You keep asking for volunteers, but it seems like you only want volunteers to do specific things at specific times rather than encourage creative collaboration. One that might result in actually giving these kids a chance at a normal school experience in all facets. And masks again are now on the agenda, a late addition at that. Keeping these kids on a constant seesaw with a dangling carrot in front of them only to slap that mask back on their face. Remember, masks could always be optional for those who chose to wear them. These kids are real people. Not once have you had a panel that included an adolescent mental health care provider. Not once have you sought out any kind of student panel and asked them how it was affecting them. You make decisions based on selected information without even acknowledging the largest stakeholders in the county, the students. This affects them. What kind of message do these kids get when they can be unmasked practically anywhere in the county except school, including the dual enrolled students at EFSC where masks are optional? In the Florida Today, it was suggested that grades 7 through 12 could be mass optional but mandated for K through 6. So we send the message that one group of kids has to be punished while the others aren't. And believe me, all these kids see these masks as punishment. Not to mention the distancing, the loss of activities deemed a normal part of growing up process. The rites of passage you all had the opportunity to participate in. Those of you with children who vote to continue these measures obviously do not have a high school student, let alone a high school senior who has had all of these things taken away from them. And they'll never get them back. They will never have an opportunity to have a homecoming dance. As Brevard students all watch across the state as they, other children get to go unmasked and attend school sanctioned dances, including Orlando, come on, Orange County? Your cure and mitigation are hurting children in the name of politics. I'd say I was disappointed in this board. That used to mean something. But now it falls on deaf ears. And by the way, these seniors are hurting. They're going to vote in the next election. Matthew, as Matthew's approaching. All right, guys, if we could hold the applause so I can get through the names, because people can't hear me, OK? If you wouldn't mind, I would appreciate it. As Matthew is approaching, Karen Colby, Angie Houlihan, and Susan Richards will be next. Mr. Dolly, whenever you are ready, sir. Uh, hello, everybody. The village idiot is back. I apologize for my absence the last few times. I'm going to be forward and say that something that raises my agitation level to 10 immediately is self-aggrandizing. And I cannot say how ripe the irony was in the air tonight to see everybody up here take a photo, photo and have the audacity to point to a sign that says serve every student with excellence. Because as most people in this room know, I'm an advocate for over 100 parents that came together, pulled our money together and filed lawsuit against the school board. And I'm telling you right now, Sophia is the one of many cases, one of many. 
special needs and not special needs. They know about them because the parents contact them and the staff. Do they care? I do not know, but do they try to resolve the issues? They do not. And it's difficult for me to sit here and clap for you to know these kinds of things are going on. To the teachers union and the school board, did you go to a school when masks were optional? How many people wore masks? You know the overwhelming percentage of people did not. And like oligarchs, you made the decision for them. I know teachers have reached out to the <clears throat> teachers union about this, and I know they have told them to kick rocks. Because by being an advocate for the parent, I have by accident become an advocate for teachers because they called me with their problem. Misty Belfort knows this because we had a problem at our school, and the teachers went to their union, got no help, and they contacted me and begged me to call the school board. Teachers don't want to wear jeans. Teachers want help. That's why they come to me. You have an army of parents, right to left, that care. Get them in the schools. Let them volunteer. You're going to rebuttal and say, well, people can volunteer. Ask a teacher how many steps they have to go through to get a parent in their classroom to volunteer. They don't do it because it's too much work. Look, look, look at all of them. Have them on campus helping the teachers. My wife and I, more so my wife, and she forced me to do it, used to volunteer all the time. We can't because it's too much work for the teachers. You want to fix your substitute problem? I'll substitute. Send me to whatever school has all the problem children. I'll do it. But I just can't have faith when we're going to sit up here and pat our backs, which I think is a great program. My child was speech delayed. Two of the board members know it because we're supposed to have conversations about it that didn't prove to nothing. But early intervention is important with reading and speech. But I'm telling you, man, this is a political thing, and you all have got to stop making it political. As I said when the health people were here, ask questions to find truth so we can find good answers for the kids, not what we want. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Karen? Karen? Hi. <clears throat> okay, I feel our families are upset. Whether it's one way or another, people are upset. I want to thank the board for honoring the 50 to 1 agreement. However, you're still in discussions and about to vote upon changing the mask policy for the K through 6 kids, which includes many of those um, by five kids. You're going to be back in violation. You've got reverse mainstream and mainstream in there with the children to affect them. Yes, I had a child with a speech impediment, and I had one that was selected for her gifted status to be a reverse mainstream. So I am on both sides of the fence, and I know how important they are. If they're masked, they're going to be useless. You might as well put one of those robots in there, the eye robots that just speak with no facial expressions. Um, I think that we need cameras in the rooms of the early intervention classes, the K through five class, through six classes, and especially as of the late occurrences that's going on. I think the parents with children of special needs would be happier and feel safer and more comfortable with you guys with having these cameras in that classroom. We all work with cameras. There's cameras in here. There's cameras in the schools. There's cameras in the hallway. Um, I think they should be in the classrooms because nobody's in there to speak for themselves. And if you have a hearing impaired child who cannot speak, plus being special needs on top of that, and you put an item on her face that says, how can she speak? She can't even scream. I was horrified because it makes us look bad. I am as horrified because it makes us look bad. We are better than this as a community. We don't have to mistreat our handicapped children. Um, if that's not political correct, I'm sorry. Um, I came here to praise people, and I was so upset by hearing the comments against this child who is seven years old. Special needs or not, a seven-year-old child is still a seven-year-old child, even though maybe she's more like a three-year-old child. She really is defenseless, you guys. Um, I know that that max may only mandate only happen because of three of you. I'm addressing this only to uh, Ms. Belford. I'm asking you please to reconsider your um, stances so that we can get our trust back in you. It's very important. And yes, we want to be in the classrooms. We want to help you. We want to help mend the rift. 
The community is horrified. People are wanting to move here and all they're seeing is the arguments over school. Some people have been talking to mainstream media and they're seeing this in California. They think we're fools. They think you guys can't handle us. We're not a problem. We're not domestic terrorists. We're moms. The lunatics were outside. They didn't come in. We love you guys. We want to work with you. I know Mr. Susson will tell you I've offered to volunteer in certain ways. And in my um, career of 21 years of having kids in your school, I volunteered constantly, plus ran a rec cheerleading team for a different sports organization. I appreciate you. Thanks, Thank you. Karen. Angie Houlihan. Angie Houlihan. Hello, my name is Angie Houlihan, and uh, I'm a parent of a Brevard Public School child, as well as being a product of Brevard Public Schools myself. Um, I just came out tonight to show my support to this board, and thank you guys for implementing this mask mandate. Obviously, the numbers have declined in our COVID cases in schools, which and that's amongst the administrators and the teachers as well as all the staff. And just like that gentleman with the uh, Teachers Federation was discussing, we have such short supply of teachers and staff in schools right now, it's important that every single one of them are in school helping our children learn. And I just wanted to thank you guys for putting this mask mandate in and having some level of, you know, I guess community transmission or whatever, I don't know, a 5% positivity or whatever the rate is, so that this uh, mask mandate stays in place when we have high uh, transmission transmission amongst our community and especially in the schools. So I just wanted to thank you guys for implementing this mass mandate and I want to, you know, I guess address uh, some of the things that some of the folks are saying tonight. If you want to get involved in your child's school, you can jo join their PTO. That's a great way to try to help out your school and support them and support these teachers and support a pay increase for these people because a lot of them are not being paid well and it's hard to attract quality candidates to teach and educate our children when they're being paid less than you know many other professions coming out of four and six year degrees in college. So again, I just came out to say thank you to this board for implementing this mask policy. I think you've saved a lot of lives, kept a lot of students and staff healthy. And I just wanted to thank you guys for that. So appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. Susan Richards. <clears throat> As Susan's approaching, the next three speakers will be Diana Haynes, Judy Stevens, and then Joanne Regan. My name is Susan Richards. I have a daughter that goes to Vieira High School. I'm not speaking about her tonight. I am speaking about Sophia. Can you imagine my surprise when friends all over the country have been talking to me about this case? This case has won nationwide attention. And why? The school says, oh, the school board made us put the masks on the kids. We didn't. We didn't want to tie a mask on her face, but she wouldn't keep it on. They blamed it on the school board. They didn't take responsibility for it. They said it was the school board. They talked to the parents about Sophia not keeping her shoes on. Did they mention the mask? No. And how come, if the mask is so important, she rode a bus to school every day, got on the bus with no mask, and came home every day without a mask on except the one day where somebody forgot to take it off. Why is that? If the mask is so important, why wasn't she riding it, wearing it on the bus while she was going home? This makes no sense at all. And the fact that this father has gone nationwide, Brevard County schools look horrible to the whole United States now. It was on Tucker Carlson just last night. That is a shame for all of you. And I know that you don't want that. So I hope in the future you will take into account these poor children who can't even speak. This poor girl's nonverbal. What was she supposed to do? She couldn't go home and tell her mommy and daddy that she was having to be forced mask every day. She had no way to tell, and that is a crime. Diana. Hi, good evening. I came here this evening with a well thought out, well researched um, comments regarding cameras in the classrooms and in hallways. And I believe that in light of what has occurred, this is a necessity. 
it is important that parents have access to their children at all times. There is no reason if you're going to replace intercom systems, you can just as easily put in cameras. Um, the incident that occurred with Sophia is, is heinous. There's no other word for it. And had there been cameras in the classroom, it never would have happened. And as the other gentleman mentioned, there are other instances where there is obviously either abuse, neglect, or something going on in these classrooms to these children. We have cameras everywhere. So there's no reason why a parent only or a legal guardian has access to these cameras. They don't have to be for public viewing. Then some events unfolded in the last 10 days that went against <clears throat> everything that I was raised to believe in on how one conducts oneself in life. The biggest violation that ever could occur in my world is the harming of innocent children and animals. I was completely, totally, and utterly appalled by the actions of members of the school board, violating the mass mandate set forth by our government, and then going on national TV and crying victim because parents that saw that broken mandate as a harmful event to their children and chose to voice their concerns <coughs> doesn't make you a victim. Then it got worse. As we all know, the innocent disabled child with no ability to communicate her frustration, her pain, her inability to breathe, her uncomfortableness was forced to endure all of the above for weeks, days, and hours. That is beyond unconscionable. She can't tell us what other things she felt because again, she's nonverbal. This was all done as a direct result of the mask mandate that the three members of this board chose to, to violate. Now, I can get up here and I can make a speech about, as a taxpayer, I pay your salaries, okay? And I can also speak about my First Amendment rights, where I can say whatever it is I choose to say to you in whatever language I choose, but I have a sense of decorum, I hope, and I'm going to try not to do that. But I can tell you now that I'm going to leave you with this. If you thought Randy Fine's statement is, was there's a special place in hell for those who did this to Sophia was horrendous, I can tell you that some of you witches in this Thank room Thank you, Ms. Haynes. Play. We appreciate you joining us this evening. Steven. Guys, once again, if I could just ask you, so everyone can hear when I'm calling their names and calling up the next group of people, can we just hold applause? I don't. It doesn't matter to me what side of the issue you're on. If we can just hold applause so we can get through everyone, that would be fabulous. No, I didn't hear it. Yeah, you know. Okay. Um, Ms. Stevens, when you're ready. Okay. Um, my name is Judy Stevens. I've lived in Mobard County for over 30 years. So I've had kids through the school system and grandkids. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was able to come and review the um, ELA curriculum for K through six and while talking to two of the women from the um, administration about the curriculum, we talked about the learning gap and how that would be handled. And one of them mentioned this great, at that point, I thought, current program, which was Thrive by Five. And I thought, wow, this is really great. So I went home and I got on the website and researched it, and I thought, oh, there's a lot, lot lacking. So thank you, Dr. Mullins, for tonight clearing up that it's really going to start oops, um, Monday. So hopefully on the website there will be somebody we can contact in case I and some of my friends who are very interested in it can find ways that we can volunteer or help with it. Um, so that kind of took a lot of my griping tonight away. So I'm going to add another little gripe. 
I know that you're trying to get out of here at a decent time, and I know I've walked out on some board meetings at 11.30 at night to a dark parking lot that's scary, but to cut down the time below three minutes is really very hard for many of us who have several things to speak on. So we would like at least three minutes to say our piece because it's important to us what goes on in education. I worked for a while at then Brevard Community College teaching everything from pre-calculus down to remedial math. And when you see 18 and 20 year olds that can barely add and subtract, it makes you well aware that something needs to be done with early intervention all the way up. And we'd all like to get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Joanne? And as Joanne's approaching, uh, our next three speakers are going to be Sarah Mursky, Michelle Beavers, and Jabari Hosey. Hello. Congratulations. The numbers are down. The math worked. Thank you. Audience members, I'm not going to say it again. Thank you to the three courageous board members who, at great personal sacrifice and in some cases great personal risk, took the step of voting in a controversial way because they have one priority. That priority is to keep children safe, to keep staff safe, and to do what they can to mitigate disease spread in our community. You did that. Congratulations. Thank you. It worked. Now let's keep it up. Normally I don't come to these meetings. I've been outside, you know, to, to uh, show support for the people that are in favor of masks. Um, I don't feel terribly comfortable being indoors um, with all these people without masks. Uh, but I got tired of watching it on TV or on my computer and seeing so many people speak against masks when that's really not the majority. Most normal people are home watching what happens the next day on TV or on in their newspaper. They're, they don't have time or they don't have the interest to come be here in person, but most people are like me. They want the community to be safe. This little piece of fabric is not a big deal. It's it's something that we're doing during a pandemic to keep people alive. It's a little piece of fabric. It's not, it's not your civil liberties, I guarantee you. Regarding Sophia, I saw the picture. It's an adorable little girl with a mask, and you can see that somebody took a, a shoelace and made a bow above her ponytail so that her little ears would be comfortable. And people grabbed on this as if- Audience members, please stop interrupting. People glommed on this as- Ma'am, pause for just a moment, okay? Sure. Sir, make your way out, please. Out, please. Great. Have a good night. I apologize, Joanne, if you'd like to go ahead and finish. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, you could see the little bow. Somebody was just keeping a little girl under their care comfortable. They were not trying to imprison her or any such thing. It's so much political bastardization of what really happened. To wrap it up, thank you again to the board members and to the staff whose number one priority is not politics. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate wait, you wait, joining my, us this evening. Pardon? That, your time is up. I, I stopped the timer when he walked out. Yeah, so thank you.
Sarah? Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. Hope everyone has been able to enjoy the beautiful weather we are having and make fall memories with your families. And I just wanted to share, because it wasn't explained, that these ribbons that we're wearing are in honor of Down Syndrome Awareness Month, in honor of Sophia. I'm Sarah, taxpayer, registered voter, student, wife, and mother of two children in BPS, and I live in District 2 for school board. And I'm heartbroken and disgusted over all the events surrounding our BPS community over the past couple weeks. Madam Chair, you are willing to defend your stance on the illegal mask policy that you were the swing vote on that you say it's now up to the courts to decide. With that, it is grossly unfair to 50% of your constituents who are now on the hook for paying your, for your legal fees. That is not in the best interest of your stakeholders and our children, and that is not serving every student with excellence as the standard. Just because something is denied from the dais does not mean it's true. Today it was reported in your workshop that BPS has about 10,000 less students than last year, whereas in a recent meeting the board stated that enrollment numbers were not down. The damages our children have suffered that many of us have brought to your attention before about your illegal mask mandate now have come out in very public ways and will continue to do so, including but not limited to lawsuits and investigations. There's a reason why I voted with my feet and moved from Chicago to Florida. Don't Chicago my Brevard. You could have simply allowed a parental opt-out sin since your illegal mask policy was first enacted and avoided all the downfall. Since three board members are so concerned about politics and defending an illegal mask mandate agenda, I do not think that a school board seat is the right place for you. We need people to serve on the board who are interested in being in compliance with the DOE, the law, and in making the best policies for our district for everyone and focusing on education, not using their board seat for their own personal political agendas. We need school board members who actually listen and engage and welcome parents, including parents who have a different point of view, who actually take their oath of office seriously, as well as the laws and directives they are governed by. I joined SAC at my child's student school to help support our school staff and bridge the learning gap. The biggest need for our children is more mental health help. The mental health professionals are not able to actually provide the mental health services that the children need. We need to take that ESSER money and employ more mental health professionals for our children who are going through trauma and actually get them the help they need. Please do not vote to extend the illegal mask mandate or allow or allow students, teachers, and staff to opt out. Let's get the focus back to teaching. Thank you. Sarah. Michelle. Hello, board. Uh, first, I wanted to address Dr. Mullins just for a moment. He reached out to me last time we had a meeting, and um, he corrected some numbers that we had I'd gotten wrong. Um, so uh, I thought it was 18. I'm sorry, 1,891 students that had left the district in that 30, no, 40 days. Um, it was actually 1,275 on that number. Um, but that still means that you're missing um, $7,999,550 in revenue. Um, and if you take away the expense of educating those children, which is, um, eight, I'm sorry, 8,788 per, per child, you'll have a difference of about $1,500 a student, so you're still missing $1,188,850, and you just lost another 20,000 that just walked out the door. Um, so I think if you limit the, the ability for us to be seen on television um, and, and recorded, then what you're doing is hiding us, and I think everyone knows that. Um, I don't think you wanna hide what's going on. I think you wanna be open with us and honest with us um, the other thing I wanted to address is um, in the beginning of this pandemic, it was never to stop the spread of this disease. It was to slow the spread of this disease, slow it, because the experts at the time said everyone's going to eventually handshake this, this disease. It's just like the flu. Eventually, you're going to get it. It's just the way it is, because even if you have the vaccine, you're still going to get it. And the bottom line is, is these children in these schools aren't going to die from this. It's just not happening. It's, it's 0 .008, I believe it was, last time I checked, um, of kids that are dying from this. So 
all you're doing is starving their brains. Uh, there's a neurosurgeon, and I did not put her name up here. I had it on my phone, um, who, uh, who came out and said, look, you know, those kids that were complaining of headaches at the beginning of the pandemic because they had these masks on all day, mom said, oh, they're coming home slow. They're coming home lethargic. They have headaches. They're not having them now. They're not having them now because eventually the body says, oh, well, it's not working, so we'll just ignore the headaches now and go on. But the damage is still being done to their brains. Which left me very little time to talk about books, is what I was really here for today. I tiptoed toward the door, peering through the window at the boy's pants around his ankles, squeezed between April's straddle legs as he lay on the teacher's desk. I swung the door open, letting the soft light from the hallway shine a spotlight on them. Shit, Keith muttered, pulling up Ma'am, I need for you to keep your language clean, okay? Oh, well, this was on, this was our school books. Yeah, I understand. Oh, but okay. at this meeting, well, I need for you to Well, then you get my point. Not... You get I'm my sorry? point, right? You get my point. These books are in our school. Are you going to keep, keep me muted? Yeah, I'd like my time back that you muted me for then. Um, these books are in our school. That is my point. That is just one of them. I have another one here. It says, see Dick, see, see Jane, hear baby Sally cry. See Jane put the knife in baby Sally's neck. Baby Sally is quiet now. That's just part of it. That also talks about going to other people's houses where your parents aren't going to know what you're doing. Um, encourage kids to play games, calling strangers that says, can you come to my party? Mommy and daddy left me alone and forgot it was my birthday. Will you come play with my party? This, is what, this was for a second grade child. A second grader. Do you, can you imagine someone's, someone's second grader coming home with a book that says to kill a baby? And it also talks about, about, about taking a fake baby and drowning it. Thank you, ma'am. Jabari Hosey, as Jabari, <clears throat> as Jabari is approaching, our next three speakers are going to be Kim Huff, Sarah Conkling, and Danielle McDonough. Jabari? Hi, I'm Jabari Hosey, president of Families for Safe Schools. Um, and we all know masks do work, uh, vaccines do work. Thought that everyone catching a virus that has so many unknowns is, is our solution is absurd. At the last school board meeting, a resolution was discussed to discourage attacks on board members after six plus months of this happening to a board member up there today, while many on the board remain silent. Uh, this board has spoke on discouraging its behavior in this room, outside of this building, yet one group and their associates and or affiliates have been the only ones guilty of this. Countless times they have been told to quiet down or follow the rules, Arrests were made outside of this building. Remarks have been disrespectful, untruthful, and obligatory hand gestures outside. The list goes on. Yet two of you who sit on this board, who harp about following rules, laws, and respect, seem to not have a problem attending private speaking engagements with this group. Mr. Hosey, keep it directed at me, please, sir. This sounds like hypocrisy, but maybe I can't hear. The same group regurgitates posts and comments via Facebook made by a state representative who is no more than an internet troll, who has made threats against the very same person you expressed in the resolution to protect. I would advise this board to focus on what is best for the majority of, their, of students here in Brevard, and again, not pander to these small pockets of hate and the groups that do not bring us together, but create a further separation and wedge in the community and within our schools. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hosey. Kim Huff? Kim Huff? No Kim Huff? Sarah Conkling? Good evening. I'd just like to thank all of you for your service to our community. I don't think we thank our administrators enough and our school board members, so let's say that. Um, I'm here tonight to support a Jennifer Jenkins school board member who isn't even from my district, but I just want to say we love you, we appreciate you, we appreciate you standing tall in the, in the face of threats and intimidation and threats of violence, and that's the number one thing I want to say tonight. And I want to also speak out in opposition to the resolution that was passed at the last school board meeting, which was in response to a letter calling for federal law enforcement intervention in the harassment of our school board members. I want to start by quoting Ellie Wiesel, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor and never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we much, must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, Sensitivities become irrelevant. 
Whenever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. The language of our local board resolution adopted at the last meeting regarding board member safety has not been and is not strong enough to discourage the acts of intimidation and threats of violence against our school board member, Ms. Jenkins. Contrary to the suggestion of that resolution, the fact that the acts of intimidation and threats of violence have been going on for six long months says that our local law enforcement, for whatever reason, has been ineffective in preventing the torment of Ms. Jenkins. This is the exact circumstance in which bigger and hopefully better federal law enforcement resources should be employed. When faced with serious, protracted, unending, violent threats of one of your members, you should not be continuing to suggest that local law enforcement is enough. It is not enough. It has not been enough. It has not succeeded in protecting Ms. Jenkins. All of you should be asking for all available law enforcement resources to end the torment of one of your members. And lest anyone else on the board think that they might be immune to what Ms. Jenkins has suffered, I would like to say I hope you're immune. Specifically, as a lifelong Democrat committed to nonviolence, I hope there are no Democrats, no Democrats in our county who would perpetrate acts of intimidation or threats of violence, just as I hope that they would never do it anywhere else. Nonetheless, the issue of domestic terror should transcend political affiliation. As humanity, we must all stand together against inhumanity. I therefore acknowledge every one of you to strongly condemn in specific <laughs> terms the acts of intimidation and threats of violence suffered by Ms. Jenkins to emphatically and adamantly disavow the perpetrators and to bring every available law enforcement resource, both local and federal, to bear on the personal torment of one of your members. Your failure to do this is encouraging the tormentors. Thank this, you, ma'am. We appreciate you joining us you this evening. Your time is unfortunately up. Danielle McDonough. After Danielle, our next three speakers will be Gordon Sumner, Ashley Hall, and then Sarah Brightman. Danielle, whenever you're ready. Good evening, board. Um, I want to thank you for doing what we needed to be done uh, to mitigate the pandemic. The evidence is overwhelming when you just look at the dashboard. I think we were at 15 cases on the most recent dashboard. Um, community spread of COVID is going to be reflected in the schools and school spread of COVID is going to be reflected in the, uh, our community. And we need to do everything we can to mitigate that. I do hope you extend the mask mandate. Um, we are still waiting for a vaccine for the children under 12 years old. So we still have nothing to protect them. It takes two weeks after their second dose. We're probably a minimum of two weeks away from the, them being eligible for the first dose. So you need to continue to make an effort to um, mitigate the pandemic. We're going towards the holidays. People are gonna travel. There's going to be um, get togethers. We're going, you know, we're at risk of another surge. So I wanna thank you for everything you've done so far. I don't think that there's, there's enough positivity in this room. I'm actually really disappointed by our community. I'm disappointed by the hatred that we hear every day. I've been a parent um, of BPS students for 13 years. I've been an active member of our school system. I've volunteered at four different schools. I continue to volunteer. The gentleman that said we can't volunteer, Mrs. Campbell and I are at Mel High on a regular basis volunteering. Um, so I'm not sure what that's about. I also volunteer at, at Meadow Lane and I volunteered at Central. I've served on SAC committees and PTOs and parent leaderships under our previous um, superintendent. So there's lots of ways to be involved. And I think that people sit in this room and they say we don't have this and we don't have that. They're just not participating. So I want to thank you for all that you do. I want to thank our teachers. And I really hope that you listen to the, the union president today because we are losing teachers. We're losing them to counties that pay more money. We're losing them because they don't want to come here to work because there's not pay. We're losing them because they're not supported. We don't have substitute teachers. We can't get them for the same reasons because there's not enough pay and because there's so much hatred and attacks on our education system. I 
believe in public education, I, I cannot say enough how proud I am of the teachers and administrators at all of the schools my kids have been affiliated with. I am so proud to be a parent at Meadow Lane Primary, Meadow Lane Intermediate, Central, Middle, and Mel High. They have outstanding teachers and they've done amazing jobs. We have a great public education Thank system. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Gordon Sumner, Ashley Hall. Hello, members of the board. My name is Ashley Hall. I'm the Brevard Chair for Moms for Liberty. I'm here to address agenda item G32, uh, the proposed parent suppression policy is what I'm calling it. I have watched for over a year now uh, board meetings, how they have become more and more contentious. I've, uh, do, you have, do you remember uh, the May 25th meeting? That was the meeting right after the special meeting ending the mandate. Were meetings during the summer contentious? No. Why do you think that was? I can tell you def definitively that it was because parents regained their control over health care decisions for their children. The balance was restored. It wasn't until the July 29th meeting where one particular board member brought back the discussion on mask mandates. And just like that, tensions flared because parental rights were once again in jeopardy. The only difference at this time was that rules were established directing school boards that mask mandates were not to be instated during the school year. Don't get me wrong. I am not, I'm not 100% against this policy change. I actually agree with the proposed time reduction based on the number of speakers. It actually makes sense to do this and forces speakers to get to their point. My real issue is with the policy changes that reduce the comments to one minute, regardless of the number of speakers, simply because someone is not speaking to the agenda. Under the new policy, that speaker would be moved to the end of the meeting and most egregiously would not be broadcast on the live feed. Didn't this board just pass a, re pass a resolution denouncing the statements of the National School Board Association about parents? Was that all for show? Because the message this policy sends right now is we don't want you here, your voice doesn't matter, and just to make sure you know just how much we don't care about what you have to say, we will turn the cameras off and not allow the public to listen. I would ask that you remove these parts, these parts of the policy as well as amend your broad statement of no signs with obscene mes messages to have a short list of things that are not allowed, such as curse words, threats of violence, etc. Anything else is suppression of speech and further divides the community. If BPS and this board really wanted to restore harmony with parents and quell the tensions in the boardroom, I would like to suggest a public denunciation of the dangerous, dangerous and slanderous accusations made against hardworking, concerned parents in our organization one, by one particular board member. All we want is to protect our children, but what we are met with is false, malicious, and baseless claims that these parents are likened with domestic terrorists and should be under federal in investigation. These attacks need to stop. There's absolutely no evidence that Moms for Liberty members have done any of these things to this member. No police reports, no pictures, no videos, no arrests. If there were evidence, we would not condone it. And we have said as much multiple times. The district's silence on this matter is unacceptable and implies their complicitness. Thanks, Ashley. Sarah. As Sarah's approaching, our last two speakers will be Sandra Sullivan and Michelle Barano. Good evening, board. I'd like to second everything that Ashley Hall just said. I am also a Moms for Liberty member, a very nonviolent Moms for Liberty member. And I'm speaking tonight on critical race theory and the American Rescue Plan, um, number six on the agenda, addressing the needs of children from low-income families, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, students experiencing homelessness, and foster care youth. My concern is in the words racial and ethnic minorities. Recently, the newly appointed Director of Equity and Diversity for BPS, Dr. Danielle McKinnon, presented a slideshow with three ethnicities, white, black, and Hispanic. There was no mention of other ethnicities, no Native American, no Asian. 
So why would BPS select certain minorities to focus on instead of all students? Is money being allocated from ARP for just certain races? Dr. McKinnon stated that she is merely reviewing documents since October 2020, that she's not implementing policy. She also stated that CRT is not being taught in BPS schools. Even when given examples of CRT in BPS curriculum, she would not admit it. Here's an example of CRT in BPS schools. The U.S. Constitution, then and now by Benchmark Education, Benchmark received grants from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Follow the money. Your, excuse me. Your BPS teachers don't like CRT. Here's a suggestion to Anthony Colucci. Tell your union that CRT must be banned in every form in BPS schools. Parents and teachers recognize that CRT indoctrination is harmful to all citizens. Oppressors and oppressed? Diversity, equity, and inclusion training, racial sensitivity training, racial healing, social emotional learning, anti-bias training, critical ethics studies are all synonymous with CRT. We'd like to say stop the bleed, just like Anthony Colucci said tonight. Stop the bleed of losing teachers and students. Get rid of critical race theory in BPS schools. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra Sullivan. Sandra Sullivan. I have three children in BPS. I have special uh, education kids, both gifted and ESC. And I'll say I was extremely disappointed when you reduce the time of non-agenda items. When parents come in, especially parents of special need kids come in or any other issue, and we come in here and to have one minute only, um, that is unacceptable. Um, you need to hear from your parents. I used to come to these meetings regularly and speak about ESE and gifted needs. I gave up, took my kids out to homeschool for some years, but we're back into BPS right now. Anyway, I would like to talk about the hypocrisy that is going on. Um, you guys, a certain school board member anyway, is talking about how much um, she, she cares. Well, if she cares so much, or the school board cares so much for our children, show it with actions because childhood uh, cancer is an issue. Um, we in, in Satellite Beach, uh, where I live, mm -hmm. we became a childhood cancer cluster for 2000 and 2010. Now I came in here and I talked about how <coughs> schools that are 50 years old, back in the day you guys used chloridane and hapaclor to treat for termites and other insects. And I requested that you, like other districts, you test the schools, the indoor quality, because this is a very cancer causing issue. Um, I also came here and spoke one day and sent emails re requesting you approve the Corps of Engineers right of entry form for Sea Park Elementary as soon as possible. They're starting the testing soon. The area to give the Corps of Engineers access is to the far left field, which is fenced and separate from the school regarding the formerly used defense site, the military dump that is under our homes in that area and extends out to the school. Why haven't you taken action on this in a few months? You care about kids, you care about them dying, but you don't care about things that can cause cancer? Or, or did you see the full page, the, the front page article of Florida Today with the vapor intrusion concerns? And thirdly, test all the beachside schools um, for PFOS. I mean, the, I sit on the Patrick Space Force Base RAD board meeting, and this last meeting this month, discuss the PFOS levels, which adjacent to Sally High School are 400 parts per trillion. This chemical now has, has been determined via research to have far more vapor intrusion potential than they Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate you joining us this evening. Have a great night. Michelle. Michelle Barano. Hello. 
Go ahead. Hi, my name is Michelle Barano. I'm a vice president for Families for Safe Schools. I would like to thank all of you for your service. And this is truly a thankless job. I, I, no matter how many people like me come up and say thank you, what you have to deal with on a daily basis is immense. And whether I agree with everything you do or not, thank you for doing it. But I would also like to specifically call out and thank the three board members who went up against a ridiculous amount of political pressure. I find it ironic that people are saying that you did it for political reasons when, in fact, the politics were aimed at your head. And uh, that was not clearly not your motivation for doing it. It was clearly concern about where we were headed. I'm, it's really easy to sit here now and think that we're all great. Schools were closing. There was staff missing in all the buildings. How many people were in the, the ER with ventilation tubes down their throats? Let's not forget that. That's why you voted for the mass, and we appreciate that. Thank you. And for that reason, I would like to ask you to continue with masks for under 12s until the vaccine is available, until they have some protection that they can, their parents can provide for them. I ask that you maintain that. I think that is a reasonable thing to do, and it looks like we're talking about a matter of weeks here. Um, third, I would like to address um, the unfortunate um, situation with Sophia. My daughter goes to Ocean Breeze Elementary School. If what is being alleged happened, happened, then that is an atrocity, okay? This board voted for masks to protect kids, and they specifically allowed a medical opt-out. If Sophia needed a medical opt-out, it should have been available to her. I don't know all the facts in this case. I've heard one side from someone with a very clear political agenda who has successfully and rightfully gotten people upset, because we should care about children, especially those of us who can't speak for themselves. I don't hear anyone talking about how perhaps the fact that Sophia was able to wear a mask because, I, again, I don't know what happened. I asked the principal. She said there's an ongoing investigation. She couldn't share any facts with me. We don't know the other side, okay? And the um, cystic fibrosis, uh, Down Syndrome Resource Foundation has posted ways to help keep masks on children to protect them from getting COVID. Imagine if you had Down syndrome and an enlarged tongue, how devastating would it be to catch COVID in your class? So I don't know the facts. I'm withholding judgment until I hear what happened. Thank you. Uh, I also want to point out the irony of people up here speaking on public, talking about how their voices are being silent. I think a minute is sufficient. If you want to be on TV, get a blog, go, go on TV, get on Thank Facebook. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. All right, board members, that concludes our public comment for this evening. Are you all good to move into the consent agenda? Or does anyone need a break? I'm good. Okay, Thank super. You. All right, that's going to move us then into the consent agenda, Dr. Mullins. There are 20, item, 20 agenda items under this category. Does any board member wish to pull any item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. I'll move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. McDougall. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Yeah, you're taking from me. Oh my goodness, I just thought it was my last. Hang on a second. Oh, I did it again. It's slow. Hang on. Yeah, it's me. I've um, got it right you, now. Cheryl? It's me. Hang on. There you go. Do you need my hand frame from mine? No, I got it. Yes. Thanks. The motion passes 5 0. All right, Dr. Mullins, will you please let us know about the items under action? There are 12 items under this category. The first one is G32 on board policy 0169.1, public participation at board meetings. The, pub, uh, the board will hear public comments regarding this policy and then be asked for a vote. Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to address the revisions to board policy 0169.1, public partition, participation at board meeting? Um, 
I'm, I'm hopeful that you guys hear us. Um, we Hold on are, one second, Katie. Your mic was not on. And sure. if you could please state your name since you're not sure. signed up to speak just so they can get record for the minutes, okay? Sure. Go ahead. My name is Katie Delaney, and um, I'm here to talk about public comment. Um, I hope that you guys hear all of us when we speak. I'm not speaking for just me. I'm speaking for everybody in this room. Um, I had an incident years ago when my daughter um, was in a, a school in town, and it wasn't an agenda item. Um, she got abused at school. The admin brushed it on the, under the rug, said kids will be kids, boys will be boys. It shouldn't be a big deal. They're just in third grade. Um, at that time, if I only had one minute to speak on this, it wouldn't be enough. When parents come here, we're coming pleading because you are our last hope. Because we've gone to the teacher, we've gone to the admin, we've gone to the you know, assistant superintendent. I went to Stephanie Archer. There was a major who literally said to me that somebody touching my daughter's private parts is not, that's not abuse. And I said to him, so if I touched you right now, that wouldn't be abuse, I wouldn't be arrested. I came here to you guys for my measly three minutes to talk about my daughter's abuse to plead for help. And I'm here today asking for that same respect for the entire community. I don't care if they want 15 masks. I don't care if they want vaccines. I don't care if they want everyone painted purple. I don't care. We deserve our time to speak with you guys. We really do want to work with you all, but cutting our time is just going to Tell parents that you guys don't want to hear us. So I really hope that <clears throat> I really hope that uh, you guys take that into account with this. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> Is there anyone present who wishes to address the revisions to Board Policy zero one six nine point one public participation at board meetings? Hello, my name is Michelle Barano. I'm horrified to hear that woman's story with her daughter, and I hope that situation got resolved. I also hope that three minutes in front of the board was not her only avenue for resolving that. Um, I feel that a minute is sufficient. I, I have emailed each and every one of you repeatedly. There is a phone number to this building. Uh, there's Facebook. There's Twitter. I do not feel that I have any inability to reach you. I also feel that any issues I have that I want to address with you don't have to be televised. If I want to speak to the public, I will address the public on a variety of social media sites, newspaper editorials. There has never been, I can write you a letter, there has never been more options for communicating with people than there are today. I think a minute allows people to get their point across, allows them to be heard. If it needs to be followed up on, as obviously this woman's case does, then there needs to be uh, of ways of that occurring, and I think those exist. So I think a minute is fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Next. Oh. Hi, I'm Julie Bywater. Um, this thing about the public comment, when you have the three minutes and it's not a non-agenda item. I mean, I spent three minutes talking to you about homecoming dances and offering you three minutes full of options, of which you never once reached out to me about. I mean, I stood up here for three minutes. Why is this such a hard thing for you guys to sit up there and listen to us talk to you about things that aren't on the agenda? We don't get to pick the agenda. You're picking the agenda. Sometimes we are going to come to you with things that are going on in the school, positive things. And we want to talk to you about it. It might take longer than a minute. 
And yeah, we do deserve to be on video, not because we're looking for attention, but because it's public record. Sometimes you don't check your email. Sometimes you're looking at other things while we're talking, and this is our chance for us to address you. Yes? This is our chance to address you. We want to be heard. You don't return our email. You kind of blow us off. It, it hurts the kids. It hurts the issues. This is often our last resort, not our first one. It doesn't hurt you to listen to us, and we're trying. Just like when I, I gave all those suggestions. I wasn't up here to complain. I was up here to offer solutions. It's really sad that you want to limit that ability. You want to shove us to the end of the meeting. You want to turn the video off. And you want to act like it doesn't exist. And that's a shame. Because you have a room full of people just dying to be invested and involved. And when we stand up here and we're speaking and you refuse to look at us, it's hard. It's frustrating, and it's disrespectful. Good evening again. I'm still Sarah Mursky. I still live in Brevard County, and I still have kids in the school system. Um, I left a couple of you voicemails today about this issue, and I appreciate the chance to actually address the board tonight on the issue on public speaking, public input. Um, so what I talked about was that how I feel every parent who takes the time to have their voices heard at school board meetings, <coughs> even parents who disagree with me or I disagree with them, should have their three minutes regardless. Um, I appreciate, again, where the board is coming from on this issue, not wanting marathon uh, board meetings, not wanting, um, trying to, to keep the tone down and, and, and keep the decorum in the room and I and I do appreciate that and and I understand that but like many of the other parents have shared when we come to address the board we're taking time away from our families we're taking time away from our schedules and things to set the time to address the board on issues that are important to us and the fact that you want to take that away or you want to limit that in any way shape or form I think is a slap in the face of parents even parents who disagree with me on issues that I come to address. As I mentioned, I am from Chicago. I worked with a lot of people, politicians, friends, church members, who disagree with me politically. And I, I can work with people who disagree with me, who have different points of view than I do. And I really wish that the board would lead by example in that way. I am, I am doing that in, in the schools that my kids are a part of. We're helping to bridge the gap as a family. That's part of our family values. And I just, I, I would want I want to work with the board even if we disagree. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. I echo everything that Sarah just Karen, said. Can you just repeat your name for the? I'll for repeat. Minutes, my name is Karen. Hi. Um, Last Colby, name. And so I'm Beachside, and I'm District Three, and I have reached out to my rep before and heard nothing. Um, mm -hmm. That seems like there has been a changed air in this. Uh, board sometimes you guys always seem to listen to us and as of late it's like non-existent and I'm scared that if we don't have our three minutes the half of the time that we are speaking you're not paying attention some of you some of you are and I appreciate that uh, we have offered to help we've offered to work with you even if we disagree with you because it's our kids that are in jeopardy here by not paying attention we didn't pay attention to what's going on with the special needs school issues regarding masks and look what happened we're national mocking laughing stocks um, I'm really embarrassed about that because that's the school I went to that's the school my brother went to and all six of my children I raised um, a legacy of kids coming up through Brevard County schools that went to the schools that I went to and my husband went to um, most of my children were a students the apple doesn't fall far from the tree they speak their mind they do volunteer work in public they work with the kids younger and less fortunate than them. All the way through high school, both my daughters cheer coached with me with disadvantaged kids. Even on days they'd rather have gone to the movies and gone out with their friends, they still were with me with 
unfortunate kids they're not even related to and they were helping. I just wanted to point that out because I can show a record of public service, of public leadership. I have never been in trouble. I have never gone to anybody's house, anybody in front of me or anybody behind me or anybody that I would meet in the future. I don't agree with it. I think it's really a heinous thing to do to our community because in our community we have to trust each other. What if something bad happens, like another hurricane? We have to all get together. And by limiting our public contact time here, coming here, we're, we're losing connections with y'all. Um, if you try to tell us we can't talk without a mask on, then put the mask off, take the mask on, put it off, take it on. It's so confusing. We already let them wear them if they want to. If I wanted one on, I'd have one on right now. And I believe in PPE because I brought earplugs tonight because that guy out front was playing obscene music on that thing. And it was very loud and could have hurt our ears. So I came with PPA, with masks, and I handed out stuff to others. So I am a team player. I'm here to offer to be a team player and to continue to be a team player. I have never been at anybody's house in front of me, nobody's house behind me, and I have no intention on ever doing that. I have separated ties with every idiot that did something like that, and I'm not apologizing for them because they're their own person. I didn't do it. Why should I apologize? And quit linking me with them. I am Karen Colby. I am an alumni, a mom, a friend, and I want to work with you. Okay? Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Karen. Next. How's this? A little hot. Sir, if you could just state your name for the record. Yeah, you got it. Jeremy Bauer, first time, long time. I wasn't planning to come here tonight and make a speech. That's why it looked like it came from a luau. We raised that um, up for him. He's bending over. You know, I, I, uh, I'm a business owner here in Brevard County. I'm a packaging company. I put people to work. I might be hiring some of those teachers that uh, left. We're, we're, we're hiring now. Give her packaging. Shout out there. Um, so, you know, I, I wasn't planning to speak, um, but I felt compelled to. There's a lot of talk of domestic terrorism and uh, people being very uh, opinionated about their about their children and potentially even something being politicized if not but i want to just pose a couple questions to the people here um mr first bowers of all, i'm going to stop your clock just for a moment to address something okay yeah um I'm, I'm sure that your intentions are absolutely pure but we do have an expectation that it be directed any comments be directed to the chair as opposed to to the audience so if you could if you could just abide that one yeah oh, okay procedurally i speak to you guys not the yeah. constituents oh okay. yeah absolutely and and on the the uh, the policy issue before us, if you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty relevant because this is going to take you know between two and a half and three minutes. I think three minutes is probably pretty pretty appropriate. So I'm going to go ahead and restart your clock. Okay. Got it. All right. Let's rock. So yeah, like I said, I'm a, I'm a, a business owner, and uh, political comment is important. Which group is the domestic terrorists, I think? And it's important that I'm saying this in three minutes, so, you know, because we've already gone through one and I haven't even gotten to my point. Is it the group that's, that's putting masks on people or the group that's mandating choice? Is it the group that's saying, hey, let's have three minutes, or is it the group that's saying, we're definitely going to limit the time that you have to speak at a public forum? Which group is more likely to be a domestic terrorist? Pretty troubling when you put it that way. So let's make this clear. I'm here tonight as a concerned citizen, a constituent of District 3, but next time I come here, I'll be a political candidate. You hear that? That's all I have. All right, this is getting ridiculous. I know. No one. Sandra Sullivan. So when I, so talking about the, the amount of time, um, I would appreciate that you, um, not reduce the time to one minute for non-agenda items. I think it's especially important to listen to parents. Um, when I came moved to this district, I came here with a, my oldest is ESE, and my um, other kids are are gifted. So what did this district do to my kids? They put my ESE kids in an ESE clustered class in the school. That is not that violates federal law. Okay. As an ESE kid that is deserve is supposed to be legally placed in a gen ed class in a gen ed class with 85% of the time to cluster him in a class that was ESE clustered. What happens is 
the performance level goes way down on Ma'am, can I ask you to speak so to the policy, to, please? When I come in here to these meetings and I need to speak about what was going on here, if, you, if I had one minute to explain what was going on, that wouldn't be sufficient. For my gifted kids, I moved up here. I have a profoundly gifted child and I have another gifted kid. And their needs are very different and they were not being met. You guys do candy peas here. You, in the school we were in, we had one lecture. Once again, ma'am, I'm gonna ask you services. to keep so to again, the policy, please. I came please. into these meetings to talk to you guys about the needs of our gifted kids. I, I have a gifted Brevard Facebook group as a consequence. I served on your gifted board until I got too vocal and you disbanded, okay? So my option, uh, I couldn't get what I needed on being a board member of SAC, so my option was to come in here on this platform right here and have my three minutes. And now you're gonna reduce that for parents with kids' needs to one minute? That's shameful, okay? And when I read that, I was livid, okay? It took a lot for me to come back into BPS, okay, to bring my kids back in here. And when I see these shenanigans that you guys are doing, it's just disgusting. Thank you. Thank you. Next. A little taller than me. Hi, I'm Michelle Beavers again. And first, I want to apologize for the language. Um, that wasn't of my choosing. That was to get the point across of the things that are happening in our schools. And on that count, um, the, the limiting of the, the television coverage would not allow parents to see things like that and understand what's happening so they could, they could address that in their schools and look in their schools for these things that are happening. Um, and I think it's important that they see not just what's on your agenda but what people are actually concerned about. So um, not just me, but anybody else who has a concern about their child or children or classrooms. Um, I think it's important that, that it's a part of public record and that we have that chance to get it on record. Um, also coming here, um, now I've, I've done emails before too that weren't answered. Coming here, it, I know you're hearing me. Um, I'm old school, I have six kids. They range anywhere from 36 years down to 11. Um, so I have a huge span. I've been in, in helping in schools since the very first one, 30, uh, I guess she would have been 30 when she first entered, 30 years ago when she first entered kindergarten. I've been in school every single year helping out, being room mother, SAC, SAC um, committee, volunteer, um, and all kinds of things. I don't think it's too much when you're getting paid to be up there once or twice a month or however many special sessions you have that you listen to the parents and you record it. I think it's a really small thing. If you have to limit time a little bit, okay, but I think it should all still be recorded. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Carrie Tagus. Um, I just wanted to say with public comment, um, I've sent plenty of un emails that haven't been answered. I've made calls and I haven't had callbacks. So this was the last avenue. It's why I started coming to board meetings. It's how I met the awesome parents in Moms for Liberty who have been nothing short of amazing. I, I don't, the stuff going on in the news, it's, it's not us. So um, the last thing I wanna say, not, don't wanna take up too much time, but there are nine officers that I counted here and they look well equipped to protect us. And I think it's really insulting to assume that they're not. Thank you guys. No. Uh, hello, Matthew Dolly again, um, still the village idiot. To talk about the time thing, as I had said earlier, <clears throat> there's two board members I had spoken with back in May who had told me we were going to talk on the phone about my child's uh, speech delay and their prosperity through the school system. I'm still waiting on those phone calls from those two school board members to discuss that topic. And the public forum is a check and a balance. It's a way for me to come here and say, hey, I'm reaching out to you, you're not getting back to me. This is why we need it. I've advocated this before, or complain, I should say, it should be longer than three minutes, not, not cut back. This public forum is important because I got to learn today that there's parents that actually get to volunteer to their school without restriction. I'm curious as to why it's parents on one side of the aisle 
they're able to come up here and brag about unrestricted volunteering access. But that gives me hope because my wife and I want to volunteer again. And also, the reason why I think time should be longer than three minutes because I also want to speak out to the domestic terrorism stuff. I'm telling you right now, a person's house is not the place. It is not the place their family was there. And I don't care what kind of flack I'm going to get for this. I saw the YouTube video of the lady out on the sidewalk. That's where you should have been. I don't fault you for that at all. Come to my house and see what you find. It'll be very similar. Someone's private property is not the place. It is sacred grounds, okay? This is the arena. This is the forum. This is where we come to combat our ideas, and that's why we need as much time as possible to do it. Three minutes is not enough. It should be longer, and you should provide coffee, like I said that one time. <laughs> but that being said, did, like, the freedom of speech is such a foundational thing. You know, without it and without some of the other amendments of the Bill of Rights, we will crumble. Please do not impinge on it. Please don't do anything like that, whatever. And I'm going to say it again because I still got 50 seconds, so it's like a heyday for me to have six minutes. <laughs> if you are the person that's going to travel to somebody's house, you do not have my support. You, as I said before, you will never stand beside me and I will never stand behind you. And with that being said, if any of these school boards feel intimidated, I know you got the police officers here. Obviously, they've done their job because nobody's been physically harmed. You contact me and I will come to your house and I'll stand on your sidewalk for you because that's malarkey bull crap, 100%. It is un-American to go to somebody's house and try to intimidate them to align with you and if you come to my house and do the same thing, you're going to get the same thing the young lady did, a pissed off parent. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Next. And guys, if we could just keep your comments focused on the policy at hand, that would be great. Thanks. Roger that. Coffee and donuts. And don't forget to state your name for the record, please. Here, again, <laughs> still. Coffee and donuts. Sorry, I'm greedy. And I like donuts. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, with regard to the policy for public speaking, I would greatly appreciate having three minutes to speak to you all. And um, you are beloved in our community. Even if we have disagreements, um, you are the force of our community and for our children. And you are greatly respected for your office that you hold. And so, you know, you are very much appreciated. With regard to the, the mask mandate, um, that mandate needs to end. The illegal mask mandate, I mean, just needs to end just altogether. Just gonna remind you, we're talking about the policy for public comment. Okay, so, sorry. It's okay. But I would like to please request that we get our three minutes and that it be broadcast so that other people that may have to work can watch it later. And I, I heard a speaker two board meetings ago who said that she watches you all no matter what state she's in. And she listed like four or five states she travels a lot. So she loves you and we love you. So please let us interact with you in our three minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Devin Marshall. Um, I am in District 3, unfortunately. Um, we've had some trouble in that district lately. So I had no plans on speaking tonight, but I do third um, donuts and coffee, by the way. Um, but I do want to get to the point. I have emailed you concerns. I have emailed you questions. I have emailed you a lot of suggestions. And I get a lot of responses whenever you're defending yourself. After you've already insulted us as parents, you've insulted a group that I support because I didn't have a voice before Moms for Liberty came about and told us that we did have a voice and told us what to do to get in contact with you. So if you're gonna cut our time and you're gonna cut us to the end of the meeting, how do you want us to contact you? How do you want us to get a response? I mean, please tell us because you don't follow through with what we're telling you during the meetings and you only respond when you're defending yourself. So when do we get a chance to have a question and answer or a discussion or a debate 
because we don't see that we have that. So I'm going to make that very brief. Think about that. Maybe send out a Facebook notification, whatever fits your fancy. I just want to know how we're supposed to communicate with you as parents who are terrified for our kids. My child is in kindergarten. I can't even tell you what we've dealt with through this process. It's not enjoyable, and it's actually embarrassing. So please, listen to us and let our voices be heard, or at least tell us how to communicate with you otherwise. Thank you. Thanks, Devin. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak to policy 0169.1, public participation at board meetings? All right, hearing none, I will entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the, uh, the current policy. I have a motion from Ms. McDougall. Is there a second? Second. I have a second from Ms. Campbell. That will open for discussion. Ms. McDougall, your motion, would you like to discuss? I, I think um, we have vetted Is your this. mic on? Oh, no, it's not on. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, we have vetted this through our um, council. We were very um, concerned. We wanted to make sure that we were following what was legally possible for us. And <coughs> Mr. Gibbs, we have, we are not breaking any laws at this point, if that's my understanding. No, you can, you set the rules for your public hearing. It's limited public forum as uh, established by statute for public meetings. You got to set the ground rules for those as long as the public's only given an opportunity unless you expanded the forum for items before the board. So that would be agenda item. And, and I want to be clear, in this policy, we have stated that we can vote to extend times. Is, is, I want to make sure that everyone, yes. we yeah. have put that in there. So I just want to make sure that people are clear on that, that we um, are not trying to limit uh, people's voice. Ms. Campbell. Thank you. I know we're trying to go back and forth, but I, I just, I, I intend to support the vote tonight, but I want to share some things, and it, because there's been a lot of misunderstanding, I, I encourage everybody, last word we to go and listen to the workshop, and I think, I think uh, Mr. Brun's department for made a little short, but I want to, there are a couple things that didn't get addressed that day um, that I'd like to talk about uh, really quick. Um, one is, you know, the board, we came together uh, in a couple of um, sessions, I think at an, our, our retreat, or a check-in, and we started talking about this back in the spring and, and started brainstorming, what, what can we do better? And we talked with council, and one of, um, so I, I will just say this, that that was one of the most, actually this process has been one of the most collaborative processes that we've had because we all gave a little, and we all took a little, and we came up with what we have uh, before us today. Um, because we're trying to make things better. We're not trying to get out by, you know, 8.43 or before Chick-fil-A closes. Um, it, they think they close at 10. Um, but we're not trying to do that. The second thing is, is as we started looking at what are the problems, uh, that I, I see the, the really definition of one of the problems is people started looking at this as an open forum. Now, I'm not going to go into the legal definitions, but I can send them to you if you'd like. The difference between an op open forum versus a limited public forum, which is what this is. Um, and. And it's, so it's been taken as we want to silence parent voices. So, and by the way, I have three points and a caveat, so it's almost like a sermon. Um, <laughs> the, over the past year, during the public comment time, people have used their three minutes to share their political opinions on how the presidential election went. They've used their three minutes to talk about immigration. They've used their three minutes to talk about how bad Democrats are or how bad Republicans are. They've used their three minutes to insult parents in the room, one side insulting one group of parents, one side insulting the other group of parents, all things which had nothing to do with this board. They've used their three minutes as a sales pitch to try to sell us various products. They've used their three minutes to share their personal sexual history. So our public is guaranteed by law and by our policy, and by this policy also, the opportunity to address the board about how we're running the district. But the public is not guaranteed a microphone and a camera to speak whatever irrelevant or inappropriate thing that they want to broadcast over our YouTube channel. And I, that is the thing that I think we all had this mutual frustration that people were using it, really abusing it, to 
to spew whatever that really didn't have anything to do. Now, we've heard a lot of things tonight, a lot of parents concerned that it's their topic that, that we do need to hear, have talked about, and, and that's going to be in my caveat here in just a little bit. But those are the things we're trying to curtail. We don't want to curtail parent voice or public voice, because some people who come talk to us have really good things to say, and they're not parents, current parents. Um, but the third thing I want to bring up is that the, a lot, uh, I don't, I think, I, want, I wonder how many people have actually read our current policy on this, because our current policy, the actual verbiage states that our public comment time is only going to be on agenda items. It only talks about uh, propositions to be brought before the board. It also says public comment time will be limited to 30 minutes, which would be three, uh, 10 people, and unless extended by a vote of the board, and then the rest of the comment time would be moved to the end of the meeting, not where we've been doing ours like before voting, but to the end of the meeting, in which case some people may have things that they wanted to say about things we were going to vote on, but we wouldn't have heard them. That is what our current policy says. So if the choice for me, and we, these are things we talked about, if the choice for me was between enforcing our current policy, which doesn't allow people to speak off the agenda, and moves people who might have things to say that we're going to vote on to the very end, and we, actually we have been counseled in our master board training to use, to use the policy, to if we're going to have a policy, we might as well enforce it. So if the choice is enforce the current policy or have a policy that guarantees that people who are going to speak off the agenda, and this was very important for me, and we, this was part of the give and take that we had to have, um, that people are going to speak, get that time, even if it's just a minute, then I'll take the new revised version. Okay? Now, we've, a lot's been said about how to communicate with us, and I, I understand the frustration of people who, who call or they email and they don't get a response, but I will continue to say that this forum, this three minutes where there can't be back and forth, um, is not really the best way, at least for me, to communicate with me, because you, I can't respond back to you, um, and I can tell you time after time after time, just in this week alone, in the past seven days, where someone's emailed us or emailed me and said, here, I have a problem, I've sent it immediately to staff, gotten a response within a few hours, and the problem has gotten taken care of. And that, to me, is an effective way of working. Waiting until a school board meeting, which might not happen for two or three weeks or more, to save it up, to say it then in a public comment time is not effective. And I will tell you this, for the people who have, who have emailed us, some people I, I can maybe think they still can only email their own school board member. You can email all of us. You can email any of us. And if you need a phone call, I talk to lots of people, including Mr. Dolly, um, who don't live in my district. I welcome you. Email me. I will get, I'll, I'll get, I'll take care of you. We are elected by our five districts, but we all are responsible for all of the citizens and all the students and all the schools in, their count, in the county. And so it's not just one person who, uh, they may represent you because they were in your you know, voting district, but we all represent all of you. So please reach out if you're having a hard time communicating uh, with one of us, communicate to all of us and we'll uh, try to take care of the problem that happens every day, multiple times a day, and I see it. Here's the caveat. I have said this to a few people this week who've reached out to me. This is not permanent. Someone said, this is permanent. It's not permanent. It's not any more permanent than our current public comment policy, which we are voting to change, uh, whether we're going to change it tonight. And it can be revised again. Interestingly, board, I have heard, and you may have as well, from people on multiple sides of a few issues um, who have a problem with one particular part. And we've heard it tonight, but I've also heard it in some phone calls and emails, and I've seen it on social media. The one thing that keeps coming back up that is um, consistent is the video piece. And so I, um, here's what I know, Ms. Jenkins, you mentioned it at our workshop that you thought, for transparency's sake, that we, we ought to leave that in, and I did not join you that day. But I'll tell you, I think, um, I think if we're listening uh, to people, as if you have had the same kind of feedback as I have, what I would like to suggest as we move forward, and then I'll uh, close with this, is that um, that we revisit this pretty quickly because I think um, I don't I think it's I don't think we can change that tonight. Correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, because that would be more than a technical change. Yeah, yeah you're voting to approve it tonight, so right. I would. Not so here think. here is what I would suggest that we or we do is if if it's if it's amenable to the board and and Madam Chair, you direct us however we want after the vote, is that we go ahead and move to revise the policy immediately and to make that change to allow the cameras to be on. Still leaving everything else in place, but that would be my my request. Uh, or uh, and if I need to do it as a motion after we're done, I I can do that. However, Mr. Gibbs says 
So the only, uh, I would just, just a point of clarification, Ms. Campbell, because I don't want there to be any understanding from the audience side on that. Mm -hmm. um, a request to revise the policy requires that we go through the policy amendment process right. again. So when you say immediate, if start the board the supports, we can start that process, right. but it's not going to be an immediate change to right. the policy. So just right. for clarification. Right, that we would start that process, in which case we've got, I think, three weeks before the next meeting. If, it, if there's room on the November workshop that we could do that, if it, like I said, if it was movement from the board to do that, and then we could vote for it in December. And honestly, the way Mr. Gibbs wrote the policy, we could probably vote that night if we felt like it to, to go ahead and leave the cameras on for the end of the meeting, but that's, uh, that would be my caveat. Thank you. Mr. Susan. Uh, she hasn't. Do you want to? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I made that I made that statement when we had our uh, offsite meeting, when we had our workshop, and when we had our last board meeting. Um, frustrating that we're having this conversation now uh, because my whole point was that it increased the volatility of the community when it came to this policy. Um, and I uh, don't know if you noticed, but most of the comments were directed at me uh, as if it was, you know, my my reasoning why we were doing this and if I, if I felt that way. Um, so I just want to make that very clear that from the beginning, um, that was something that I said. I don't understand the point of turning the camera off. It just makes the public think that we're trying to hide something, even if we're not. Um, there's, there's no point behind it. People have cell phones and can record it anyway, so we might as well just, just keep it on. So um, I'm with Ms. Campbell on that one. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Mr. Susan? Thank you. I had a couple of things. So I went ahead and, um, you know, we got to a point where all of a sudden there was a lot of community input. And I started looking around and started asking people, I said, uh, what do you think about this? I started pushing back and forth. So in the community, I got consistently, why does this matter? We pay the taxes. It's our three minutes. It's all right. Right? Okay. The employer groups, um, a lot of them, our buses, bus drivers, everybody else started telling me, why are you restricting our speech? We may have to come in on an issue. There might be 10 teachers that want to come in and speak. You're going to limit us and you're going to take us off. That's not fair. Okay. Um, fellow elected officials. So I called around to many of our elected officials and talked to them. And each one of them, I mean, there was not one that said, they said the optics on this are really bad because of the timing that you guys are doing it. They said, and we don't and we wouldn't. And then one of them in particular, two of them actually, gave instances where people would come in and do exactly what you're saying. It's like, we have the, the local, not, nothing against you, Matthew, but the local village idiots that come in and speak about everything that's out there, right? But that's their right. That's what they do. So I was like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm listening, I'm going. And then I started looking at, and I called two of my friends. One of them's a very, very... Um, well-known attorney up in, in Tallahassee, and there's another one here locally that's well-known. Both, um, both First Amendment lawyers with over 30 years in First Amendment. And I asked them, I said, is this legal? Is this, is this right to do where you're taking the visual off at the end? And they both said, with 30 years experience, that there is some gray area there, but it is not a sound and strong policy. So after I talked to the attorneys, after I talked to the community, after I talked to the fellow elected officials, the employer groups, I then came back and started looking at it. And I said, what are the optics on this thing? It looks like we're trying to reduce it during a time when we have the, height, the most heightened up awareness on our school board. So just the optics. And what that does long term in our community is the trust and transparency and everything else. And I, and, I, and I understand, and I will say to everybody in here, there is not, that is not what this is about. Just as it was said before, this was not brought forward to do that. But it's what it looks like. And when we have to start gaining the trust and transparency inside of our community, even though it's not what it was meant to be, along with the lawyers, along with the community, along with the employer groups, along with the fellow elected officials, I started having some serious issues, okay? Um, and it just got to me that the optics were bad and that that piece that you talked about was one of the issues I had a, a problem with. The other problem is, is that we are limiting the people who come afterwards to one minute, no matter what. But we're limiting all the other ones to multiples. So if there's 10 public speakers, they get three minutes. If they're, I have a problem with just having each speaker afterwards only speaking for one minute because there may be, as it was stated here tonight, and I've talked to other people, 
an issue that takes more than one minute. For somebody to come down here to a non-agenda item, it's got to be pretty serious, and they may want that extra more than one minute. Now, we can always vote to extend, but that might not always be there. So then I started looking at that, and I said, you know what? I can't support this policy the way that it's written. So, um, Gibbs, I – don't tell me no. Don't do it. Um, we can amend it now while we're here, and then we start the process, right? If you change it, you can't vote to approve it tonight because then you – But that's one extra step towards it. You can that's say you're going to yank it off the agenda and to start the process over again. That's fine. But if we start the process – I mean, I'm hearing from one board member and another board member that they want this you, too. You can't satisfy rulemaking because you're going to change it. So I have to advertise 14 days prior to a workshop and that's your first public hearing, and then 28 days prior to adoption, which is your final hearing, so tonight. So you, tonight cannot be your first meeting. It has not been advertised for 14 days. The rulemaking process is 14 days prior to a workshop, 28 days prior to your final adoption. So, okay, I get you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't physically believe in that portion of this policy. I would like to, I will vote against this because I don't think that even if you don't believe in it and she doesn't believe in it, that we should do it and then force it upon our people and then change it in three terms. I just don't. And what, whatever. I mean, so we stay here a little bit longer. We listen to a little bit more, you know, and that's all. So I would, I would like to make that amendment, but I can't. So I will be voting against this in the attempt that we can bring it back and go through the process again. I guess we could, um, I want to talk about what Mr. Shin said, but in just a second. But I just want to, you know, it was mentioned this evening, um, someone talked about the State Board of Education meeting. And I, I understand the frustration about the one minute, but I, every one of us here tonight um, experienced people who were watching the clock and were filling the time, you know. Uh, some of us experienced uh, the people who got to the three minutes and they could have gone for another three and they had it written out and, you know, you know and so they were to go over. But then, but then we also have had two meetings recently where everybody got one minute. And it was pretty successful, I'd say. Everybody got to the point, and we got it in and we got out. And the State Board of Education meeting that was met, you know, man, those guys are ruthless because that chair of our State Board of Education, he give, they gave him one minute, and if you got off topic, he didn't just remind you, he cut it off. So, you know, um, I think we can, we can get this done, uh, but I... To, to your point, Mr. Susan, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out which way we do it, because we have two ways. We could go ahead and, and vote tonight, and every, that'll be up to everybody's choice, and I hear what you're saying, that you're, you don't want to vote for it tonight. Um, and if it passes, we could go into you know, rulemaking at the next workshop and go ahead and change it. It would pass, you know, the for earliest we could vote on it would be the December meeting, and then we could vote at the those two meetings to go ahead and leave the cameras on. We could, we, it's, you know, we can, we can do that. Or we can vote it down now and not have the thing in place. I just, I go back to what we're guaranteeing in this policy with the revisions is to hear the non-agenda items. And I know this board has been very gracious to hear those, even if they are trying to sell us something. Um, but I just, you know, so I, I'm not really sure which way, I don't know, Mr. Gibbs, where, where are we with the, voting one way or the other. I mean, I'm trying to figure out what difference it makes. It's your item. So, I mean, you guys can vote it up or down. If you want to pass it, you can pass it. If you want to say we're going to go to rulemaking and three of you vote it down to go back to rulemaking, we can do that. Okay. So. Sounds like it's going back to rulemaking either way. <laughs> can I speak? You want to? Yeah. Can, can I, um, only because, yeah, I, well, I, because I haven't spoken, if, if you want to go ahead and go no, again, Ms. Jenkins. Okay. No, it's So, um, and I'll come right back to you, but, um, so, <clears throat> I think, um, to your point, Ms. Campbell, I think, I think you made some really great points and, and pointed out some really important things. And I think we have to say again, this forum is not 
the best forum for resolution of concerns. And <clears throat> I'm gonna, Ms. Delaney, do you mind if I reference you personally? Okay, so Ms. Delaney referenced, and I, and I say this because we had a conversation yesterday where she expressed her concerns and shared the situation of her daughter. And the only thing that I will say is, I think we need to verify that that student was not at a Brevard public school run by the district, it was at a charter school. Um, because I think that's an important differentiation in how staff handled the situation when you reach it out to them. But as I shared with her, it's much more effective to pick up the phone and call me and let's work through the issue. As opposed to waiting for a board meeting, as you said, um, you're right, and, and she, the point she brought back was emails get lost or don't get responded to sometimes, and I absolutely agree. Um, I, I think we all try to get to them as much as we can, but at the end of the day, all five of our cell phone numbers are on the district website. The main district number, Ms. Escobar, over here, um, takes calls for the board members and sends us messages uh, to follow up with her. You can always, obviously, send us email send her email and she'll follow up with us. Um, I think there are lots of ways to get in touch with board members that are much more effective than coming and speaking at a board meeting. And I would agree. I, I don't think that, you know, some things, waiting for a board meeting or coming to this, this public forum is the way to do it. Um, and I just wanna reiterate what Ms. Campbell said, which was that um, once we are elected, we serve all of you. So if, if I am your designated representative for the schools that you attend and I'm not responding to you, then please call any one of my peers because I really try hard to return all of my phone calls, but there are times when I am buried for whatever reason and can't get back to you right away. It might take me a day or two. I have faith that they will be responsive uh, and do all that they can to assist you. And the beauty of it is, I can immediately, I spoke to a father this afternoon on my way to the board workshop, was able to get with staff when I got here to have a conversation so staff can start looking into the issue and follow up with him. As opposed to no response, waiting till the next board meeting or any of those things. So I think we have to really think about the purpose of the public comment and what we're trying to achieve with the policy. And one thing that hasn't been addressed that I think is really important to be addressed is there are a lot of people who don't come to board meetings because they can't sit through hours of public comment um, because they don't have childcare, don't wanna bring their kids, don't wanna, there are a lot of people who don't come to board meetings because the environment, and I appreciate the person that referenced appreciation for keeping decorum, um, because that's what we're, <laughs> Sarah's waving her hand. Um, because that, that's what we're trying to accomplish is a forum here where we can all hear what we need to hear and have it be done respectfully. But you know, at the beginning of the meetings, I say every meeting, this, the purpose of this particular meeting is for the business of the board. I don't think there's anyone up here that doesn't want to hear from our public. Um, I've, we get meeting requests all the time. Hey, can we have coffee and talk? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Doesn't matter if I agree with you or disagree with you. We're all working for the same goals, right, for our kids. So I just want people to understand that this forum is designed for a very specific thing. And we are happy to make ourselves available outside of this forum to address things that need more of our time. I just don't want it to be perceived that we don't want to hear what you have to say but we need to ensure that we're doing it in the most efficient and effective way to work with you. And that's not necessarily coming up and, and speaking at the board meeting for three minutes or six minutes when we have policies or like, we can do this. We can do this together. We're not trying to silence you. Um, and I, you know, I, I appreciate the concerns about the videotaping and I would absolutely support if after we take the vote, if you guys want to, start that policy amendment process, but I do think that it's important that we go ahead and make the changes that we have put in place to make the meetings more manageable for so many reasons. For those people who can't come and spend all that much time, for the people who, um, who stand there and try to fill their three minutes. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a lot to that. So, um, Ms. Jenkins, I will gladly turn it back over to you at this point. Sure. Um, 
I have to be like perfectly honest with you guys. What's more frustrating than listening to somebody sell me something for three minutes or be vile to me for three minutes is listening to us go round and round and round in circles about a policy we already discussed three times. So can I please just call the question? Thank you. <laughs> Jenkins has called the question. Is there any opposition? Without rebuttal. Do you want to respond? You already went twice. <laughs> you already went twice. <laughs> All right, and the motion passes three two. Miss Belford, can you read it to the public who voted which way? It's on the screen. So you can see it. Okay, good. Just people that watch it can't see. Yeah, and people I don't. People that watch it can't see. That's all. I mean, it's just I don't know. Sometimes in tighter votes, people. I think it's probably a and I don't, um, it, my screen doesn't even show me who voted how, Matt, so they have Thank more. I, nay, I, I, nay. Okay. So, um, Ms. Campbell, if you would like to bring that issue back at board discussion, yes. I'll go ahead and move through the rest of the action items. Is that okay with you? Yes. All right, Dr. Mullins. Sorry, it took me a second to find where we're at. Yep, got it. Section, <clears throat> section 1001.39, subsection 1 of the Florida statutes requires any board member travel outside the district exceeding $500 to receive prior approval to confirm the travel is for official business and complies with the rules of the State Board of Education. An opportunity for the public to speak to this item must be provided prior to, to action by bo the board. Each board member has indicated his or her wish to attend the conference. First is item G33 on Cheryl McDougall's travel request to attend the FSBA conference November 29th through December 3rd, 2021. Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G33 on Ms. McDougall's travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G33 on Ms. McDougall's travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. It's approved. Moved by Ms. Campbell. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Jenkins. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Yeah, what, am I supposed to vote on my own? I think I think you guys have done this in the past. <laughs> yeah, okay. we all have. Paul's giving past. us a nod. Yeah, not break, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I vividly remember a, a school board meeting where it was a really difficult question. <laughs> so I'm having major. Is anyone else getting a showed that everybody in here sign? except for you? Everybody but you voted. Yes, if you would please. Aye. And can you give me the vote count? Okay. Motion passes five to zero, Dr. Mullins. Next is item G thirty four on Jennifer Jenkins travel request to attend the FSBA conference. Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G34 on Ms. Jenkins' travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G34 on Ms. Jenkins' travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Please vote. Can 
motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins. Next is item G35 on Katie Campbell's travel request to attend the FSBA. Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G35 on Ms. Campbell's travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G35 on Ms. Campbell's travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. McDougall. Is there any discussion? Please vote. The motion passes 5 0. Dr. Mullins. Next is item G36 on Matt Susan's travel request to attend the FSBA conference. Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G36 on Mr. Susan's travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G36 on Mr. Susan's travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Jenkins, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Please vote. <laughs> the motion passes 5 0. Dr. Mullins. Item G37 is on Misty Belfort's travel request to attend the FSBA conference. Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G37 on my, my travel request to attend the FSBA conference? Is there anyone present this evening who wishes to publicly address item G37 on my travel request to attend to the FSBA conference? Mr. Dolly, are you raising your hand or just stretching? Okay. <coughs> Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. McDougall. Is there any discussion? It's really Katie, but no. Oh. Is Katie faster? <laughs> no, 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 no. You want it, Katie? I'll give it to you. All right, hearing none, please vote. Yep. The motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins. Next is item G38 on possible amendment of the emergency mask policy. Thank you, Dr. Mullins and members of the board. Um, as you all see, so the, this process has been a little bit different um, because we're so accustomed to working from recommendations from the superintendent on the agenda. So um, I did request addition of this item to the agenda. <laughs> Um, and have put forward recommendation, a starting point, much like we had before. Um, so at the October 5th special board meeting, we approved a motion to continue the current emergency mask policy until we reached 50 COVID cases per 100,000, at which point the board had to take no action. It allowed Dr. Mullins to remo remove the mask mandate or update the, the mask mandate with a parental opt-out <coughs> and employee mandate unless social distancing is maintained in effect until Octo October 29th unless it's extended by the board. Uh, obviously, as I reflected earlier, I'm thankful to say that we reached that, that uh, measurement on Friday and the superintendent was able to implement that parental opt-out. I'm very encouraged by the numbers um, and certainly we wanna see, I, I would say we all wanna see those numbers go down. Um, I did ask to have this item placed on the agenda to extend that policy for the final 30 days and I would just remind our public this is an emergency policy, so it cannot be extended beyond this final 30 days um, in the least restrictive manner possible to, in my opinion, still take us forward. Um, my recommendation, and as I said, it's a starting point, certainly open to discussion, is that we continue to require masks for our students in pre-K through sixth grade because there are no vaccines available. Um, and, and while I think we can all celebrate where we are, I don't know about you all, but I'm still hearing from a significant number of parents that are concerned about the safety uh, of their students, especially those who are not yet eligible for vaccines. 
So um, the recommendation or, or the request is to continue to require masks for students in pre-K through sixth grade with the parental opt-out option. And then for students in grades seven through 12 and adults, uh, making masks strongly recommended, uh, but not mandated. The only other thing that I would throw out there, and Ms. Campbell, you may want to weigh in on this particular request. Um, I did, and I think we all got the request this morning from, um, I wanna say it was a chorus teacher, that was requesting that we continue to require masks in classrooms where students are going to be singing. Um, based on the study that we talked about, the Colorado study. I, 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 okay. No. Um, so yes, there was there was concern uh, expressed about not having a mask requirement for indoor singing in seven through twelve. Um, so I will, with that, as you all know, I don't motion. Um, so if anyone would like to make a motion, um, and then we can open for discussion or however you all want to move forward. I can make the motion. Okay. I'll make the motion. Can I just make the motion that we discuss this as the current, current recommendation? Uh, you can make a motion to approve the current recommendation, and then it can always be modified in discussion. Okay. I, I make a motion that we approve the current recommendation. I have a motion for Ms. McDougall. Is there a second to open for discussion? Second. And I have a second for Ms. Jenkins. That would open for discussion. Ms. McDougall, your motion, your discussion. Okay. Um, I do like that um, our middle school and high schools, because of the option of, of also, of if they want a vaccine, they can get a vaccine. And I, I feel that we're there, definitely there. And I think that makes perfect sense. Um, I'm not the expert about singing. I'm going to leave that to Ms. Campbell to talk about that some more. Um, I do think at this point we do need, um, I get a lot, a lot of emails from people and phone calls telling me how they want the mask mandate. I would um, like it to be with a parental opt-out, not a medical opt-out. So I really support how you have raised this amendment at this point. I only have a concern about, Dr. Mullins, maybe you can help me. How does, how does that look? How does that look when we get the forms into the school? Because you and I talked to a principal the other day, and what he, what that principal really said that, yes, he would follow, he definitely follows it, but it would have been better not to just say email it or send an email, but to print it off and bring it in so that one person is not inundated like the secretary of their email gets all filled up. So how would that work if we did it that way, if we had forms that people like, I don't know how it's working now, with the parental opt-out currently. I don't know what feedback we've heard. I'm sorry, Ms. McDougall. I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. I Could can't, you rephrase it? I can't me? understand why, but. <laughs> 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 so but basically, how is it working with the current parental opt-out? What kind of workload are we finding with our schools? Have we had that feedback? And what are the principals or the, the administrators saying about the forms that are coming in? Um, I, I have not heard any, any, that feedback has not come to me directly. I'm not aware that there's been a difficulty in, you know, receiving the, op the parental opt-out forms. I, think, I anticipate schools have adapted to the method which they have been turned into the school, whether it's via email or brought in by the student, but they're collected in the office and then they are cataloging those uh, turned in forms. So. Yes, you did ask my question, but there's there's one more question, and I, I don't know if it's been answered. I do know that there was a constituent that asked uh, that they talked about um, that we're noting, we're documenting it in the, a system, and was concerned about how that was being used or not being used, and do we document it in a system? And I, I think we need to share with the public why or why not we're doing that. I'd have to call that. Dr. Thuddy, do you know if we are actually inputting students indication that they are a parental opt-out in AS400? Or is it retained in the front office for the administration's reference? This is truly a better question for Chris Moore, but my understanding was there was a data element on one of the S screens in AS400 that these um, they'll be put into at some point, but I don't know for sure. I got a thumbs up from Dr. Sullivan in the back. <laughs> and um, here comes Chris Moore. My, my great 
uh, team coming in through the magical door there. Uh, but so to answer your question, Ms. McDougall, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to anticipate that our school teams are entering those into the appropriate field in AS400, so then any staff at the school can look that up and know if a student has submitted a parental opt-out or not. Thank you. Did I? Did I? Yes, you, you did. I wanted to get do. around to your answering your question, yes, Ms. You McDougall. Did. All yes, right, you thank, thank you. Miss um, Jenkins, you seconded. Do you want to go next on discussion? Yeah, uh, I'm just going to be really quick. I um, the only concern I have about this, I'm fine with the parental opt out. We've hit that number, like we agreed upon. But um, for the seventh through twelfth, uh, personally, I think it should be a required mask. We know that no one's going to wear it if it's not required. If the intention is to mitigate, we should be putting it there with a parental opt out as well. Um, because we can't assume just because vaccines are available that all of our students have access to those vaccines. Um, and I think it's our responsibility as an educational institution to keep those students safe, but then there's that simple parent opt-out form if their parents don't want them to wear a mask. Um, I think it kind of you know, takes care of both sides there, but you know, takes the responsibility off of us, making sure that we're keeping all of our students safe regardless of their socioeconomic status or the ability to get to a vaccine. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Anyone else want to discuss? Mr. Susan's giving you the finger, Katie. All right. So, that was not nice. I'm supposed to go second to last. So it's, it's All right. Expecting. So I, sorry, I was taking just a minute to look up a couple, couple things because the last time I had checked, that study from University of Colorado Boulder had not been updated in a long time. So I was just checking, and it didn't look like I don't know if they have. I can't see any more. Um, studies, uh, but they did release some more information in the summer about uh, arts, particularly band and choir, the, you know, things where you would be blowing through things. Uh, actually, can you just go so I can finish this up really quickly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. be done in like two minutes. No problem. Paul, can you read me the actual emergency mandate? You sent it to me the other day. Can you pull that up? Sorry, I didn't give you a heads up. Because it, it is written completely different than what we, like the, the preamble, the basis behind it, all of that is geared towards something else, if you'll just read that. Because I think that once we start seeing that, it's, it's, it's a little different. Because we're amending something that we're not looking at, right? You see the beginning of it? It references the court cases, it references. Right, the preamble is about uh, the basis for implementation of the mask mandate originally adopted and it talks about lawsuits that are currently yeah. in place right it yep. says the reason that we are the, implementing yeah. this is because of the lawsuit that has and the judge had defined it based on that and that has been overrun by the dca right it's been stayed by the dca but it also goes into the parent bill of rights and uh Exception set forward in Florida statute like the uh, 25236 and so. But the basis behind our argument for this, which is stated inside of that, was for the original prior to the most recent updated changes by the governor, correct? Yes, it was the original implementation by this board. And the justification behind it is for the previous, not the current. Mm -hmm. So we are basically making an argument to impose this based on the previous laws and regulations and the argument and everything else. That's what it says in the preamble. I don't know what you're referring to. The Do previous, you like me to read it? The previous I mean, laws. I can read it. I have it up. But I mean, you want me to read the whole thing? No, just the beginning because it sets, the, sets the, the, the premise behind what we're doing is based on a premise of a previous lawsuit that was stayed by the DCA. Right. Then a new right. rule has come in. So like literally the the fundamental legislative intent behind it right. All right. is old. The preamble, Judge John C. Cooper, Florida Circuit Court for the Second Circuit of Florida found that the Centers for Disease Control is the preeminent authority in the United States for infectious diseases and control. Moreover, Section 252.36 sub 1 sub C Florida statute states the legislature intends that during an extended public health emergency such as the COVID-19 pandemic, there should be a presumption that K-12 public schools to the greatest extent possible should remain open so long as the health and safety of students and school personnel 
can be maintained by specific public health mitigation strategies recommended by federal or state health agencies for educational settings. The CDC qualifies as a federal health agency as specified in Florida statute. Moreover, CDC guidelines explicitly recommend all individuals, students, as well as staff wear face coverings while inside, whether they have been vaccinated or not, until the spread of COVID-19 is better controlled. As the Florida well, legislature- we're good. We're good. Yep. I just, what I was trying to get at was, is that we base the beginning of it and the intent. So if you guys are gonna pass this, I would try to reword that beginning so that it's stronger for the argument rather than quoting a previous case that was stated. That's all. That was part of the beginning of it. That helped. I'll, I'll keep going, but it was just a recommendation. All right, so we've heard from multiple speakers that the hospitals, the CDC, um, our district, um, every number that is out there, every single data point is at the lowest that it can be. The lowest it's ever been is in the 30s since this has started. And we've only been below 50 for now 30 days, total over 18 months. So my common theme that I'm going to get to is, is at what point are we not going to have opt-outs? And at what point are we not going to have people wearing masks and, and having policies and everything else? Because what it's doing is, is it feels to me, as we're starting to put in the AS400 op piece and we're starting to put it all in, that this is slowly becoming permanent. And, and that's not where we started with this thing. So let me get started. So right now, I talk to bus drivers, teachers, administrators, the teachers union, the community. The bus drivers cannot enforce it. I am telling you that they are screaming that they cannot enforce it, that they do not want to. Our bus drivers in many areas have been told that they, they should not try to enforce it because it becomes dangerous for them to consistently look behind and try to force an opt-out. Plus, they don't have an opt-out list every day that they get. There's nobody walking out and presenting them an opt-out list. The teachers are upset because the kids have been given an opt-out and they don't. They're forced to wear a mask and they don't have the opportunity to opt out themselves. The administration, the administration from the people that I've talked to are trying to mitigate this as much as possible, but you have people emailing, carrying in opt-out forms. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of work. And we've heard from the employee groups and everybody else that everybody's stressed beyond belief. So having more work into the pipeline at a time when every single data point is low enough to support it, to me, it doesn't justify it. Our own union has come out and said that they do not want the opt-out forms anymore. They're done. They want their own people to have, they want the employees to be able to choose for themselves. They have said that. I, the community has shown us through the way that they act, not just the individuals that come in here. I get it, it's both sides. We have football fields, football stadiums filled, basketball arenas filled. The communities are all doing outside of what we are doing. And I get you, we worried about people being, we're worried about keeping our kids safe, but everywhere they go outside of the schools is not mandated. I tried to find one single place in the, in the county that does have a mask mandate that you have to perform an opt out. I, I couldn't find it. So with the community showing us that the, for the community showing us, for the teachers union calling for our employees to not have to mandate it, for the administration that's being overworked because of the opt-out forms, because the teachers themselves want it, because it's not fair to have the other kids be able to do it, because the bus drivers can't enforce it, because the numbers are so low, and because the efficacy of actually trying to enforce it is difficult. And it's more difficult now that the numbers are justified that we told the public we were moving to a certain direction. And so now we keep going into the seesaw. We go into the seesaw of coming up with this every week and the mental health and the problems. I mean, our parents are worn out. I heard from them say, I've heard people that are mask mandate supporters call me and say, I'm just worn out. 
I just want this thing over. I mean, people that were like basically yelling at me before are saying that to me. And I just, like, my thing is, is that you, Japan doesn't have a mask mandate. Like, the one place you would think has one doesn't actually have one. What they do is they recommend it. And their entire population goes up and down based on the threat level. They just do. It's incredible when you allow people to make a choice on what they're doing that they make the right one. But the instant that you start telling people they can't choose, they will fight you. I've got five kids. I tell them anything. They will do everything opposite of what I do. And if you give them the opportunity to make the right choices, to make their own choices that they can make, at a time when all the numbers, I mean, if this is where we are right now, with all of the numbers at the lowest place that we can be, is this our reality for the rest of our existence? That's, it's scary to me to think that the rest of the world, the community, the teachers, the employees, everybody are moving on, and we're still in here trying to create something that's creating more work, animosity, mental health to our community. That's my opening statement. And I look forward to you guys with rebuttal. Please don't call the question. Thank okay, well, you. So, um, sorry when you said that was opening your statement. I thought you had more paragraphs to go. I do. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm not going to give it all out now, Tim. I, I just quickly about the um, the music stuff. Um, I'll just there there was there was no further study done except for they did a survey of. Uh, the, the programs, I think most of them were secondary. There were some post-secondary uh, programs that they asked. They got sent a sur survey out of 3,000. They got, you know, pretty good number, tw almost 2,800 back. Um, their recommendations that they sent out over the summer it included the same things that we had in place last year, which were um, using outdoors as much as possible, using the indoors. If you're indoors, using masks, using bell covers for the bands like we had last year doing rehearsal times, um, they increased it to 50 minutes if you have good ins uh, filtration, three air exchanges uh, per hour, and you consider longer rehearsals. F physical distancing, they reduced that to three feet. Um, hygiene, you know, dropping your spit from your trumpet on the floor, those kinds of things. Um, and using face shields and partitions if necessary. Uh, but they specifically talked about masks and bell covers being this specific material, MERV-13 material or something compromised. So, by the way, none of those things we had in place at the beginning of the school year, except, uh, except for we tried to social distance and as several teachers did. We did not require masks. We have no band has used bell covers. I have not seen a single instrumental trumpet, clarinet, any using bell covers. We're not doing that at all. We have not released, uh, reducing our rehearsal times. I do know some programs, choir programs, that are rehearsing outdoors. Uh, because that's the, the, the choir teacher, but they were not directed to do that. That was the choir teacher's choice. And those kids have been outside in the heat rehearsing the best they can uh, before we had a mask mandate and then since we've had a mask mandate. Um, we are doing the official fiscal distancing um, as much as the rooms can, can handle. Um, you know, the hygiene, I don't know if they're not allowing the spit to be dropped on the carpet, I can't answer that, but we have not had that requirement, so they're not doing, uh, that's just program by program, teacher by teacher. So the data, when they did that, they what they said was, you know, self-report back over last year, what worked, based, not what worked, but how many of the mitigation measures did you put in place, and how what evidence of spread within your program was there? So here's the results, and there's some mix, because they're not sure, it even says in here, you know, some of it's not clear. Did it actually happen in the music class or did it happen in another place? They made the assumption that it happened in there, not in a cafeteria or not as they were walking out or at, when they went and spent the night with a friend or whatever. It said out of the 20,000 programs who came to uh, return to activity, four and a half million students were expected to participate. Um, they did a risk assessment. So I'm just going to cut down to the most important number. Um, it says, the overall expected chance of getting COVID in a 30-minute rehearsal, uh, I'm going to read you the number, if you don't use any of the study mitigations, would be 0.00037% or 1 in 273,124. That's if you didn't do any of those things. So I say all that to say 
Uh, and by the way, that is a greater chance than the people who used all the mitigation strategies who were like at .000051 or one in, you know, a million, whatever. Um, the chances are very, very low. And I'll point out again, we had none of those mitigation strategies for choir or band this year. Our programs have done successfully, uh, successful work. We haven't heard, I haven't heard of any, uh, when we were having all our great outbreaks of them happening more often in band or course classes. So I would absolutely recommend against making any adjustments. If we have choir directors who are particularly, they can continue to rehearse outside as they're, as they're nervous. They have the freedom over those uh, programs, but we've had indoor concerts. We've had, you know, things going on, outdoor concerts. Um, successfully, and I would just very strongly request that we don't make any of those changes. It's been very difficult for our music programs to have to deal with what they're dealing with. Um, on the mask mandate as a whole, I, I'm just a strong no. If I could just yell no, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I just want to yell no to the top of my lungs. I don't want us to continue in another 30 days, and I would just point out that this board, when it first came up on August 30th, and we had the policy the way it was originally written, and we made the one, the one big change that we added was to change it from 90 days to 30 days and we'd revisit it. That 30 days was good enough. The 30 days was good enough. We got to the end of the 30 days and we weren't at the point. We, made, we added the 50, or I don't know if the 50 was in the middle, but we got to the 50 and we said, you know, that's good enough. When the 50 comes, we're gonna drop it. And then we changed it to, when the 50 comes, we're gonna do a parental opt-out. But at some point, the 50 was good enough just to drop it to let the superintendent just drop it. And, and now it's not good enough. And I'm very, very frustrated that we're having this conversation when we were almost to the finish line for many of us to get to Friday and, and it continues to not be good enough. And now we're changing it again because the parental opt-out, you know, getting down there is not good enough. And I, I, I am so grateful that on here, we're allowing the staff to, for it to be optional for them. Strongly recommending. I'm so grateful that uh, that this or the recommendation that we're allowing, but we're rec recommendation is for the secondary students. But I think we just need to keep it clear across the board from pre-K to our, our youngest ones, who are the very least likely to have issues. Our parents knowing what the options are, the ones who are extra afraid. Have we gotten any? Do we have the KN95 math available to kids? Yes. We do. We have KN95 masks available to kids. If that's what the parent wants, we will provide them to them. I know we, we had some problems with shipping. They were coming from Singapore, and you know, who knows, the ship's getting stuck everywhere. But we have them available for parents who are <clears throat> still concerned and parents who are waiting for the vaccine. You know, we have those things. I, what was good enough then, now that we've reached here, we keep moving the finish line. And I'm, it's very frustrating to me. And I just ask that we would just go to what we originally thought was good enough, which is when we get to a good place in our county and an even better place in our school district, and we've got school districts all around the state that are showing they didn't do what we did, and yet they're also getting to those, that same good place, that we don't have enough evidence to support con you know, continuing to put this restriction in place. And I would just add that, you know, Mr. Susan shared already, my, my same frustration with the, the parental opt-out all along is the inconsistency. Now, I will tell you, yesterday when I dropped off my son, I watched, you know, kids. I was curious. Who's going to have a paper in their hand? Who was going to not have a mask because, it, you know, Monday was the first day? And honestly, most of the kids at that middle school got off the bus, and they had their mask on. They went to the building, and I thought, well, either they didn't know, or they don't care, or they didn't want to be the only kid because they're middle schoolers, and nobody wants to stand out. So I don't know how it was the second day, because today when I saw them, they were outside, and I didn't get to see them uh, going in the building because we did our, our walk. The rest of the week will have yet, has yet to be seen. But I, our, our teachers have already said we have an MOA with the teachers that say they're not going to enforce it. They don't want to have to enforce it, which means it will be dependent on the teacher. In one, in one teacher's, which honestly, it's kind of like this already, to be honest. In one teacher's class, you have to wear them. In another teacher's class, you don't have to wear them because this teacher is going to enforce it, and this teacher is not going to enforce it. And honestly, we're back to the place where we were first talked about the opt-out, where it's mandatory. So if you, child, who does not have a, an opt-out, if you don't have your mask on, you're going to get in trouble, or I'm going to be correcting you all day long, which is tiring. While well, you have this student over here who doesn't have to wear one at all, and there's, there's no discipline there. So the inequity in that is 
also frustrating. And the only time I voted for a parental opt-out was because it was the lesser of two evils. And I, but I've hated it all along, and I still hate it. And so I would just ask that we just let it go. We get to Friday, and we say goodbye, and we move forward, and, and just be done with it. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak again? Mr. Susan, do you wish to speak again? Okay, you guys aren't about it. I just, yeah, sure. Um, so we're putting the teachers in a liability because of exactly what she said. So imagine yourself inside that classroom with that student that's sitting there and they have the opt out form but Johnny right next to him is dropping it or doing whatever, ADHD, and now he's being forced and now he will be disciplined for it. That teacher, if they're not doing it to efficacy, in some, in some of our schools, we've already heard from principals that said that it would be on their evaluations. That, and then I received emails from people that said, how could you ever not think that they should be you know, reprimanded on their evaluations for not having a mask? The community doesn't support it by the visions and what they're, by what you see on TV and what you do in the community. The evidence doesn't support it in any single way. Bus drivers are out of masks half the time. They can't even offer them to the kids. We're consistently moving the goalposts on our community. Our community thinks this is it. This is going to be good. We're moving into it, and then we move it. This is it. We got the numbers here, and then we move it. And, and, the, and I got real scared when all of a sudden I found out that we're putting that thing on AS400 because that starts to become permanent. The governors and the legislature are getting ready to go in and they're getting ready to change everything that's happening. The lunchrooms, just so everybody is consistent, lunchrooms have a third of the school in there with no masks on, sitting right next to each other eating. Anybody wants to go watch it, go to Vieira High School. There's 700 kids in a lunchroom that are sitting there looking at each other with their masks off in one big room, talking the whole time. So for 20, 30 minutes at a time during the day, our entire student populations are in massive non-mask areas with each other. And ultimately, where it all comes down to to me is, is that if my kid, if I told my kid to go wear a mask and I wanted them to wear it in there, they're not going to or they're going to when they leave anyway. So whether you give them an opt-out, whether you do it or not, the teachers are slowly going to not enforce. The administration is slowly not going to, and it is going to become non-valid. And my fear, ultimately, right, is that when it comes time to come back up, because it's coming back, this is three times it's been in here, and it comes back, what's going to happen then? Are we going to go right back to it? Are we just never going to come out of this? And that's my fear is, is that we as individuals are, are not doing what we should and we're forcing something on the parents and on the children and creating a massive mental health problem for our community. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Susan. Uh, if I could just address uh, a, a couple of comments from you both. And I, you know, I, I want to make it clear that um, regardless of how the vote comes out tonight, I, I respect the perspective and, and input from from both of you, and I understand your frustrations and where you're at. Um, one thing I, I do want to address, Mr. Susan, going back to your original comments, was the, the fact that the DCA stayed the, the uh, judge's comments um, in the beginning of the, the policy. And I just promised myself I wasn't going to go here, but since you mentioned it, um, I think it's important to note that the DCA stayed the ban on the Department of Health policy, but the DCA has not weighed in on the legal analysis of that case yet, right? Because when they filed for the appeal, they, they put the stay back on the ban on masks, but they, they're, the only analysis that we have on all of this at this point in time is from that one case, because the appeals court hasn't weighed in on any of the arguments of that case. Is that a correct interpretation, Mr. Gibbs? Yes, there's no decision yet. So I don't think that we necessarily need to, uh, need to worry about the language in the beginning of it, and that's, that's the only reason I say that. 
Um, to your point of becoming permanent, um, as, as stated, this, this policy can only go to the end of November um, unless we go into rulemaking to amend our permanent policy. So um, I get your concerns there. I absolutely do. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's even, it's in, it's in the language of the recommendation, it's everywhere that this is, this is it, it can only go there. Um, the recommendation, which is what the motion is on, actually removes the requirement for teachers to wear masks and makes it strongly recommended for, for all of the adults. So that would be our faculty, our staff, volunteers, visitors, vendors. Um, so I, I think there was some misunderstanding there. Um, and you know what, you're right. It, it is a lot of work for our teachers, but our current policy runs through Friday, and I would suggest that the majority of the opt-outs already, are already in process, right? So, um, and, and to your point, Ms. Campbell, I don't love the, the idea of an opt-out either. Um, I commented initially that I didn't think it was going to be effective, that I thought it was going to make a lot of work. But the reality is, and I go back to, and, and this is the crux of, of my choice, um, is we still do not have vaccines available for our five through 12 year olds. And something came out today, and I've not had a chance to read it in depth, but it looks like we are very close to FDA approval on that. Um, and so that, that is really what's driving my concern. And, and based on the feedback that I'm getting from parents who have little ones that say, you know, we, um, we, we really have no protection for them if there's no mask requirement. So um, the, the recommendation I put forward was to try to find a middle ground that we could um, come together on that would address Ms. Campbell's concern about employees, that would address um, concern about any unnecessary paperwork um, to put forward really what, you know, the, the least restrictive, given the fact that things do look so good and that we are so close to a vaccine for our youngest ones. Um, and so I, like I said, I, I respect your stances and, and I, I'm not looking to, to argue, but, <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, I, you know, we'll, we'll walk away however it comes out and I will, Still have the utmost respect for you all, so I just think that's important to uh, the state. So, is there any additional discussion? Was that called the question was thinking? All right. These votes. I think I'm gonna have to. Yes, ma'am. We did no, not. We did not. I had to refresh mine. Oh, no, I, I, voted again. oh I just voted against you again. <laughs> did you approve my travel? Can you tell me that? No, I just unapproved. <laughs> Thanks, JD. Just not. Yeah, mine's still stuck on my. Yeah, seat. mine. Even read. Ms. Escobar, can you take a voice vote for us? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. The motion passes three to Ms. Yeah, Mr. Susan. Uh, Dr. Mullins, just so that the parents in the community understand, is there a way to explain what's happening? Because, you know what I mean? Like, I think. Right now, everybody was, are we going to wear masks? Aren't we going to wear masks? But now, completely secondary, starting what, next Monday, will not be required to bring an opt-out or anything, right? If you could just kind of just explain that for the people that are on here, and then maybe send out some kind of information tomorrow to the parents, that's all. Yes, sir. We'll work on communications as ASAP to our community so they're aware of exactly what the standing is. So the employees don't will be required to wear masks until Friday and then coming back Monday they'll be in the clear? Is that what it is? The mask policy, the current mask policy is in place through Friday, the close okay. of business Friday. When employees return on Monday, masks will be optional for all employees. Students in 7th through 12th grade will be 
strongly recommended and students in elementary school will still require a parental opt out. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Susan, for that clarification. I'll go ahead and, uh, and also uh, make the board aware by the end of the week, I will uh, review the other remaining mitigation strategies and provide schools and uh, uh, an update as well as the board by the end of the week, what the update will be for the following week. Thank you, Dr. Mullen. All right, uh, if I'm tracking correctly, we are back on item G39, Dr. Mullins. The next action item is G39 on department school initiated agreement. And board members, you may want to try to refresh your screen if you were hung up on the travel item while we, uh, what are the wishes of the board? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Please vote. The motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins? Item G40 is on procurement solicitation. What are the wishes of the board? Move to approve. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Please vote. Limited the motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullins. Item G41 is to approve the naming of the Adult and Community Education Manufacturing Building to the Johnny Fred Bailey Senior Manufacturing Building. What are the wishes of the board? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? I just hate that all the turmoil of the evening has diminished every other good things, but this was exciting. I hope you guys read the bio of the gentleman. I haven't gotten to meet him, sounds like somebody to meet, but I'm very pleased with the name that was chosen for this building. Yes, thank you, Ms. Campbell, for that recognition on this particular item. I know we had a couple of community supporters that came earlier, <coughs> excuse me, um, in support of the item and have, have since left. So. Um, but certainly a, a lot of uh, support for this this particular naming. So uh, I, I would echo stuff. Mr. Bailey has been a long-standing member of the community and made, quite frankly, generations of investments in our and our kids across the community. And uh, it's a very worthy recommendation, and appreciate the board support. Absolutely. Is there any additional discussion? Hearing none, please vote. The motion passes 5-0. Congratulations, Mr. Bailey. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, right. Put it out there. Um, all right, Dr. Mullins. Item G42 is to hear public comments on board policy 5112, followed by board action. Is there anyone present who wishes to make comments regarding the revisions to board policy 5112? I'll do it. Okay. Is there anyone present who wishes to make comments regarding the revisions to board policy 5112? No. Come on. It oh, I was just reading that. Revisions to number 5-112, entrance requirements packet. Do you have a copy of the packet we can see? It's it online. It's to the agenda. Okay, my question is, is it going to cost us anything, and who is it benefiting? So it's not a Q&A session, Karen. It's just for you to make public comment on the policy. Okay, so I vote against can't... it because I don't know what it is, and you all couldn't explain it to me. So. Thanks. Um, that information is on the agenda. 
All right, is there anyone else present who wishes to make comments regarding the revisions to board policy 5112? All right, what are the wishes of the board? Vote to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. The motion passes 5-0. Dr. Mullen. Our last action item is G43 on the 2021-2022 student progression plan for Brevard Public Schools. You are being asked to authorize the superintendent to advertise for a public hearing on the plan. What are the wishes of the board? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Susan, seconded by Ms. Campbell. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please vote. <coughs> The motion passes 5-0. We will move on to the information agenda, which includes items for board review and may be brought back for action at a subsequent meeting. No action will be taken on these items tonight. Dr. Mullins. There are two items under the information category. <clears throat> Does any member wish to discuss either of these information items? All right, that then is going to bring us to Board discussion, Mr. Susan, you had a request for a substitute va vacant teaching position discussion. Yeah, it's real quick. I just wanted to say <clears throat> kudos goes out to the ESF staff for going out and covering all of our schools. Many people don't know this, but because of the lack of um, substitutes and vacant positions, our ESF staff, to include superintendent, went out and covered into the schools. So when this started happening, I started looking back over the last six, eight months, and I realized that... Um, you know, when I substitute, I feel the school different than when I visit it. I don't know if you guys feel that way, but it's just different when they close the door, you're with the kids, and you can have those communications. So what I would like to do is move forward with us, with you, maybe discuss it in a board workshop as an item, just discussion, about possibly making anybody who's not in the schools that may be, you know, above the teacher grade, maybe in ESF, everybody just substitute one day. And the reason is, is that many of the individuals that, that we have, including myself, I was a teacher uh, many years ago, and I, I, I lost touch with the classroom. I mean, I was really into it. I mean, I was there, but now when I get in there, I substitute, I can feel it, but I, it's not the same. So what I would like to do is look into a possible um, policy to have more involvement with our staff into the schools, not so much for filling the subs. I mean, that's gonna happen. But just to get that feeling that we get when we, when we substitute in there and feel it. And even if it's just one day, it gives them the perspective of what our teachers are dealing with because every year is different. That's it. So I just wanted to bring that up and um, put it in towards a discussion uh, in the future. That's it. Ms. Escobar, could you do me a favor and make a note to add that to our future uh, board off-site conversations? There we go. We got one coming up. We just approved it today. Yep. Uh, Ms. Campbell, did you want to request that uh, Mr. Gibbs move forward with amending the public comment policy on that uh, video issue? Yes. Like, <coughs> yeah, so we can, if we can, I know, I don't, I can't remember what we have on the agenda for our, our November workshop day, but there's room to squeeze that in. I don't think it's huh? All right, I'll, I'll get with uh, my parallel. Is there any board member opposed? Okay. And Mr. Gibbs, you're clear on what the area of concern is that needs to be amended? Yep. Okay. I have another. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. To see what happened with the mask mandate first. Go right ahead. Um, so I've gotten some feedback. I'm sorry, there are like little bugs crawling all over the place. Yeah, there's some whole bunch of um, Might have been my steak. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. Somebody stole so, it. Or your bread. There's been some angst about the opt-out policy. And I asked Mr. Gibbs if he wrote it, and he said no, it was 
his understanding was kind of a conglomeration of what some other districts had done. So I've, I, you, you may have gotten, I think there was at least one email that came to all of us. I've gotten a few, to me, questions. I've seen some feedback on social media, concerns about the language of the opt-out form. Um, two, two problems. One has to do with liability, um, and the other one has to do with um, acknowledging that the board can uh, tighten or loosen restrictions as needed. So um, I would just put, you know, I signed the form. I sent it, I gave it to my kids. I said, you know, put it in the mask basket. Take the opt out or take the mask, whatever you choose. Take both, uh, whatever you choose. But, you know, some people have concerns. The liability part, to my understanding, I don't remember if this is the exact statute. Mr. Gibbs, you can help fill me in. There was a, the, in the legislature this spring, they passed a, a bill that had to do with um, uh, COVID liability for schools for, and even for hospitals and things like that. There was another bill. Um, so that if someone gets COVID in a, a business or a school or whatever, who's taking reasonable precautions, then you can't sue because you got COVID in that place. So this is that statute, correct, Mr. Gibbs? Yeah, 76838. Okay, so when people, I, I think one of the concerns about that piece of it was that if they signed this, they were saying that they, they were losing all their rights to sue the school board for, um, because they didn't want a mask mandate. And I, I don't think that has anything to do with it. No, that, that's just referring to the statute. That's what the statute does. If the school district is materially compliant with a recommendation of a federal or state health agency, we are immune from lawsuit unless right. certain requirements are met. Right, so the kind of people who would be signing an opt-out wouldn't really be concerned with that, probably. Um, so then the first part is also bothersome for some about the school board maybe tighten or loosen restrictions as needed. I mean, I guess technically we did that tonight by loosening. Uh, before the end of the 90 days, we could come back in our November, I don't know why we do this, but in November 17th and tighten it back up. Um, but at some point, the 90 days ends. Um, so, you know, there's been people saying, I crossed out the parts I didn't like and signed it, or I sent in my own form. I'm not really sure what's happening. Ms. McDougall is asking about how this is being handled. But, um, I, you know, if it had be, been me and nobody asked, I could have just left it to my child blank will opt out from wearing a mask, parent signature, and a date. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that because I don't, you can understand it. You don't have to agree with it. And I just tell people, just sign it, send the form. You do what's right for your family. If you don't feel like sign it, don't, don't sign it. But um, if you're just saying, I understand that they will continue to review, I don't have a problem with it, but some people may, but it doesn't really, it's not really making very much of a difference. Um, and if someone crossed it out, I don't really know a principal that's gonna say, no, you crossed out that one sentence. So I'm not encouraging people to cross it out. I'm just saying, you know, I just feel like we, created a bigger problem with the way this was written. Um, is there any uh, movement into changing and just making it a little simpler? Um, not that we make everybody do it over again, um, but since now we're gonna need this for another <coughs> month uh, for our elementary school students. Um, well, that's what I would say, but people are still having a problem with sign it and send it in. So. Um, like I said, cross out the words you don't like, highlight the words you like the best, you know, sign it, send it in. But I, but I did want to clarify the legal, le legalities of that part. You're not signing, that, that's already been established. Yes, it's just a reference to the Florida statute granting immunity. So okay, I, there, there's nothing in there that we're saying you are waiving it. It's just a reiteration and letting people know what Florida statute is. Right, thank you. Madam Chair, just for clarification, I take responsibility for the form. I, would, I directed staff to put a form together that was reflective of what other districts had used. The language that's there is reflective of other districts, albeit not necessarily on the form, but in other locations across the district. Mr. Uh, Gibbs, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe staff did go through, you did review the form, although you yes. didn't necessarily write the form. Yes, I have no issues with the form. Okay. Thank you. And that's that, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm a big fan. Ah, I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. Um, so I appreciate that you. There goes another bug. Sorry. 
<laughs> it's all coming me. Um, so, but again, you know, if parents are concerned, you're not actually saying you're willing for them to be further restricted. I mean, it's it's just an acknowledgement, or you understand that. So I just encourage people, if you want to use the opt-out, to go ahead and sign it, because it's, it's really not going to make one difference whether you cross it out or sign it as is, but you do need to have a form if you're going to opt out. Or do it all. And it's not like, I'm not getting like dozens and dozens. I've just seen a handful, and I just wanted to address what that actually means. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, I have had a couple of inquiries as well. So um, I think that's definitely important information. Dr. Mullins, do you have anything more? I do, if the board doesn't have any other closing items. Cool. And I, it'll be a good one, and I think you'll appreciate hearing it, quite frankly. And so will the union and our principals. Uh, credit to Dr. Thetty and staff were, have been working on, actually, finding ways to incentivize our subs to cover what we anticipate are soon to be what I'm calling high demand sub days. So we're, we are instituting a high demand premium pay supplement for our substitutes who commit to subbing on Friday, November 12th and or Monday and Tuesday, November 22nd and 23rd. That's the Friday after Veterans Day. We have, we are closed, our schools are closed for Veterans Day on November 11th, uh, $50 for every sub that covers those days, in addition to the regular daily rate, obviously, which actually gets, I think, even the lowest daily rate paid sub well above the $15 an hour. So uh, <laughs> it's not where all the distance we want to go, but it's definitely a big step in the right direction. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Savage, I'm disappointed that Mr. Colucci didn't have the fortitude to uh, <laughs> stay the whole evening to hear the great announcement, but I know that you will pass it along. Just kidding, Anthony. Had to give you a hard time. <laughs> I don't know. Past his bedtime. Uh, but if the union would help us get that information out and communicate that, we're going to hit the highways and the byways and encourage our, our subs to uh, help us out on those days so that we ensure we've got our schools covered. Because those are historically higher teacher vacancy days. That's phenomenal news, Dr. Mullins. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Thetty and team, for working on that to make it happen. We appreciate it immensely. Does anyone have anything else? All right, hearing no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Have a great night. <laughs>